Well, g'day, it is Ken Colson here, and we are live around the world for the first time with Creation Unfolding. And today, I've got guests, uh, Dr. Marcus Ross and Dr. Matt McLean. Uh, they are trained paleontologists and young age creationists, and they're going to be talking to us today about feathered dinosaurs. So this uh, presentation, they actually presented on this at the International Conference on Creationism uh, just this year in July. Um, and I wasn't there because I was I was at the ICC, but I was presenting somewhere else. And I said to them afterwards, well, I want to see it because everyone's telling me this is it was such a great presentation. But it turns out that it wasn't recorded. So I thought, well, how can I see it? And then how can other people see this fantastic presentation? And here we are today uh, with this live session. So I want to welcome everybody, uh, let you know that the comments are going to be on. So as we present, if you have comments, go ahead and put them up. And then uh, we're going to break the session up into four parts. And after each part, there'll be a time where you will be able to ask questions. So uh, let me uh, bring both of our guests up onto the screen here right now. And uh, let me formally introduce them. So uh, g'day, Matt and Marcus. How are you guys doing? So let me introduce our guests, uh, first of all. So we've got... Uh, Dr. Matt McLean. Uh, he is the interim dean of the School of Science, Math, Technology, and Health. He's the chair of the Department of Biological and Physical Sciences and the associate professor of biology and geology at the Masters University. He is a vertebrate paleontologist who works on dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and other extinct creatures as well. And Matt is president of the Creation Biology Society. He is married to Jessica, and they have four children, Alaric, Cody, Iris, and Soren. Now, just some other platforms. Uh, Matt uh, is also uh, involved in uh, an organization called the Center for Thinking Biblically. And uh, you can go there, it's thinkbiblically.org. And uh, if you go there, there'll be other resources that you can look at that Matt has done. Um, also, he uh, participates in the annual Creation Biology Society meeting, the annual Creation Geology Society meeting, and the annual uh, Creation Theology Society meeting. So go online, do a Google search on those. Uh, he's also got resources on New Creation Blog. Uh, so that's newcreation.blog. It's a new young age creationist resource. And he's got a book, uh, a well, um, uh, a well uh, pictured book, illustrated book on dinosaurs, hopefully coming out next year. And Dr. Marcus Ross, well, he is a paleontologist and CEO of Cornerstone Educational Supply. He earned his PhD in geoscience from the University of Rhode Island, studying the diversity and biostratigraphy of marine reptiles known as mosasaurs. Now, he taught at Liberty University for 16 years, serving as professor of geology and director of the Center for Creation Studies. And today, he remains a fellow of the center. His work in creation has touched on paleontology, geology, flood boundaries, and created kinds. Uh, just want to plug uh, Cornerstone Educational Supply. Uh, it, look, if you're a homeschooler, you're involved uh, in, in any kind of science, you need some projects, then you need to go to Cornerstone and pick up those supplies. They specialize in custom science kits that fit all different publishers' curriculums and university distance learning courses as well. And you can find them at cornerstone-edsupply.com. So uh, having introduced you guys, um, I just want to welcome you. I'm really excited uh, about what we're going to be discussing today. So um, I think, uh, Matt, you're up first. So should we just go ahead and, and kick it off here? Sure. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, you want to put my screen up there so people can see it? Yep. Let me do that. Okay. All right. So, um, Matt, I'll just let you take it away. Okay. So, um, like uh, you heard from Ken, um, Marcus and I presented this at the International Conference on Creationism, um, Feathered Dinosaurs and Their Implications for Creation. And this is a four-part thing, okay? So um, we are going to be looking at dinosaur anatomy and identification, 
uh, modern birds, feather types and fossil birds, dinosaurs with feather-like structures, and then finally research results and creation implications. So I'm just going to talk about topic number one right now. That's dinosaur anatomy and identification. Essentially, what is a dinosaur? And the first thing we got to think about here is the fact that there's not really like one thing when you think of a dinosaur, right? There's all kinds of different shapes and body plans and diets and behaviors that would be represented by these things. So you can see everything there from tiny arm, big, you know, meat eating dinosaurs to absolutely enormous long neck dinosaurs, things with spikes and plates and horns on their bodies. You've got little tiny dinosaurs um, that have like basically one functional finger, all kinds of really fascinating things happening there. Um, a lot more than just the traditional, we think of, you know, big reptile kind of thing. So we got to ask the question then, well, what is a dinosaur? Why are all those things dinosaurs and not other things, right? So um, when you go to like Dollar Tree, which is no longer just Dollar Tree, now it's like Dollar 25 Tree or whatever, but you know, you go and you pick up these little bags of dinosaur toys and stuff and um, you can find, they'll say like dinosaurs and they've got like all these little guys in the bag. And um, some of these things are imposters. Some of them are not dinosaurs. Um, you can see I crossed them out there. So um, why do people call these things dinosaurs and um, how do we think through them rightly? So when we talk about what a dinosaur is, um, Dinosauria as a group was named by Richard Owen um, back in 1842. Um, Richard Owen uh, had three dinosaurs that he put in the group. He had Iguanodon, Megalosaurus, and Hyliosaurus. Um, and Owen said they are characterized by a large sacrum composed of five ankylosed vertebrae of unusual construction, by the height and breadth and outward sculpturing of the neural arch of the dorsal vertebrae, by the twofold articulation of the ribs of the vertebrae, the bones of the extremities are a large proportion for size, you know, for saurians. He says they're terminated by metacarpal, metatarsal, and phalangeal bones with, with the exception of the ungual phalanges, more or less resemble the heavy pachydermal mammals, so talking about elephants and stuff like that, you know, rhinos and things, and attest the terrestrial habits of the species. So why do I tell you all that? There's not a quiz later. I just wanted to show you, you know, Richard Owen in the 1840s, he's, he's not just randomly saying, well, these things are dinosaurs, those things aren't dinosaurs. He's actually taking the time, looking at the anatomy, trying to figure out how we classify these things. Um, and Owen is thinking of them as really big, amazing animals that are walking around on land that have similarities with mammals in some ways, even though they're reptiles. Um, so when we typically think about classification as general public people, uh, we think back to what we learned in grade school, right? We talk about Linnaean classification, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, right? Um, so when you think about dinosauria that way, it's a, it's a group of reptiles. Um, a later guy, H.G. Seeley in the 1880s, he said, well, there's two types. There's Sariscians and Ornithischians. So you can see the Sariscian hip on the left there. That's like your meat-eating dinosaurs and your big sauropods, the long-necked ones. Um, and then on the right, you have the Ornithischian condition. So those hips belong to things like Triceratops and Stegosaurus and stuff like that. Um, and Seeley thought these are two very different groups of things. They're not actually one thing called dinosaurs. Um, and so there was some debate about that, right? Um, but both of them recognize, as we still do today, that dinosaurs were unique among reptiles, at least the reptiles they knew at the time, um, for having an erect posture, right? So you think about a typical reptile, um, like I have a bearded dragon as a pet at home, and he runs around like this. He's got sprawling limbs, and um, you know some lizards will even drag their bellies. Um, crocodilians can walk a little bit higher up, but still, like they're they're not designed like a mammal right where you see the legs directly beneath the body think about a giraffe or a horse or a cheetah um dinosaurs help hold their legs like that their legs are directly beneath the bodies um like you would see in a bird or in a mammal and so that makes them very unique among most of our reptiles and people recognize that dinosaurs are a type of archosaur that's a big category of reptiles that would include things like not only dinosaurs but pterosaurs and crocodilians and all kinds of other stuff um and so Linnaean classification like i said what we learned in school pretty straightforward, right? The kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, big group. You got smaller groups and nested inside of bigger groups. Pros for that, hey, it's clear and simple, right? And it emphasizes discontinuity. You can say there's this group and this group and this group, and they're discrete, and that's nice. But there's some cons. There's some drawbacks to Linnaean classification. Number one, it kind of sets up arbitrary boundaries, right? So the order tubilidentata, that's what the aardvarks are in, okay? We have one living species 
in one family in one order, tubula dentata. There's a few extinct aardvarks, but they're basically all the same thing, okay? Contrast that with another order of animals, Coleoptera. That's the order that contains beetles. There are over 400,000 named species of beetles, um, not even remotely close when we're comparing one species in order versus 400,000 species in an order. Additionally, Linnaean classification kind of makes things seem more rigid than they really are, right? Um, there's just very clear, distinct groups. When we look at living things, they can be kind of hard to classify sometimes. Uh, it also gives us the impression that we know more than we do about fossil animals, right? So we look at the living animals, we're like, well, there's reptiles and birds and mammals and, and everything that's a fossil has got to fit in one of those groups. Um, but do we know that for sure, right? And ultimately, Linnaean taxonomy depends on a form of what's called essentialism. This is where um, you're making the traits and groups, um, you know, it kind of makes them a little subjective. Um, you're saying like, this is defined by this. Well, what if you find something that's just like these things, but doesn't have that one little trait? What do you do at that point? So when we think about dinosaurs as reptiles, we got to kind of think about what that means, right? Because when we think of reptile today, we think of these five living categories of reptiles, right? Our crocodilians, snakes, um, lizards, the tuatara, and turtles. Um, modern reptiles are scaly. They're what we call cold-blooded, right? They're, they're typically um, poikilothermic exotherms, okay? They're lethargic. Um, they lay eggs. Um, yeah, that's what we think of when we think of a reptile, right? So when we use the term reptile, that comes with a lot of baggage, right? And we have to be really careful what we mean when we start applying modern terms to fossil animals, okay? So, you know, in the fossil record, we've got pterosaurs, right? These are flying creatures covered in some, you know, they've got some scaly parts, mainly naked skin, and they've got what looks like little filaments all over. We'll talk about those later. Um, you've got marine reptiles that are giving birth to live young um, that have blubber, we know from fossils. Um, they certainly seem like warm-blooded creatures. Um, we've got dinosaurs, right, which are walking with erect posture and are very active animals, very different than what we see in modern reptiles. Dinosaurs aren't just overgrown lizards, okay? They're fundamentally unique from modern reptiles in many, many, many ways. So you say, well, why, why do we still call them reptiles at all? Well, because they have lots of skeletal traits that are similar to other reptiles, right? Um, there's a lot of things that are still in common. Well, over time, um, with evolution coming in and just the more we think about things, people decided, well, we need a different classification scheme. And so cladistics kind of stepped in um, because cladistics allow people to do phylogenies, which are evolutionary trees. Okay? And so with cladistics, what you're doing is um, you're classifying things based on branches, like in a tree. right? Um, now, this method doesn't automatically assume common descent um, when you use it. Um, you can think about it in different ways, um, but because it's used by evolutionists for phylogenies, you're assuming common descent when you're doing it. Um, and so, for instance, the new definition of dinosauria with um, using cladistics and phylogenetics, you say it's the last common ancestor of Triceratops hordus, Passer domesticus, Diplodocus carnegii, and all of its descendants. Um, and that's a very long definition. Um, from Barron et al. 2017. And they had to redefine it in 2017 because they did a new um phylogeny of dinosaurs and they recovered ornithischians um, closer to our meat-eating dinosaurs and the sauropods farther out and the old definition didn't include diplodocus in it and so what that meant was um suddenly things like brontosaurus are no longer dinosaurs and you're like whoa that's weird that doesn't make any sense right so they had to redefine their terms and that's an important thing whether you're using linnaean classification or cladistics you constantly have to update these things as you discover new things, right? Whether it's discovering new creatures or just discovering new things about the creatures you didn't know before. Um, and with this kind of methodology, you name groups based on what's in there and what, you know, the, if you think about it in terms of, of evolution, it's the most recent common ancestor and all of its descendants. And because they believe that birds evolve from dinosaurs, then birds are considered a type of dinosaur. And like I said, you can think of cladistics apart from evolution, um, you can just say this node and all the branches that follow it, um, in which case you'd also have birds listed as a type of dinosaur. Now, as creationists, obviously, we don't think that everything shares a common ancestor. There's not one evolutionary tree of life. Um, and so we would say dinosaurs are made up of multiple created kinds. That would make sense, given all the different shapes and things I showed you before. 
Um, but it's important to remember that baromenology is not a taxonomic system. Um, these are two very different things, actually. Baromenology is focused on what's in a created kind. Okay. Um, so, for instance, um, you know, I've got some dinosaur baromenology right there on, on the right, but I'll, I'll show you one that we're familiar with. Um, here we've got uh, horses, zebras, and donkeys, right? Um, we would recognize these as members of the same created kind, as creationists. Um, they also happen to be members of the same taxonomic group, equus, um, the horse genus, okay? But all of these are also mammals. But mammal isn't a created kind. That's just a classification term, right? And they're also vertebrates. But once again, vertebrate isn't a created kind, right? There's multiple created kinds of vertebrates. It's a classification term we use to describe these things. So we have to be really careful that we're not confusing these two things. They are different um, systems we're thinking about there for different purposes. Okay, so now that we've kind of talked about classification and all this kind of stuff, um, what really is a dinosaur, okay? So we can think about it this way. A dinosaur is an archosaurian reptile possessing a suite of traits, including things like a perforated acetabulum. That's a fancy way of saying their hip socket has a hole in it, right? So you think about your hip socket, um, you know, you've got like this cup thing and the ball goes in there for the, the upper leg bone, right? The thigh bone, and it rotates in there, okay? Um, dinosaurs, their acetabulum, their hip socket, it's actually a hole. You can see through it. Um, and so the femur just fits right into there. And that's a unique dinosaurian trait. Um, and we also find that in, in birds. Um, and then dinosaurs possess an erect posture. They have their legs directly beneath the body. And there's other traits we can look at, but I just wanted to keep it really simple. Um, or you could define dinosaur using that cladistic definition that we saw earlier, um, the clade that contains Triceratops, Passer, and Diplodocus, the node that unites them and all animals more branchward from that node. Now, maybe you started listening to this, really hopeful that I'd show you lots of dinosaurs eating people and stuff, and so you weren't paying attention. Hey, here's the too long, didn't listen version. Ready? Dinosauria is a large, diverse group of reptiles possessing upright stances, varying drastically in diet, habit, and size. There's all kinds of different things. In fact, we think there's probably around 35 to 75 different created kinds of dinosaurs. There's a lot. Okay. So when we think of dinosaur, we often think of a type of animal. We think of like a dog, right? Or a cat, but we cannot think that way. Okay. Dinosaur is a big group of animals. It's something like mammals or amphibians where you've got tons and tons of different types of things that we collectively call a single name. Okay. It's an immense group of creatures full of amazing differences in form and function, well designed by our creator. And as a result, there's lots of extinct things that aren't dinosaurs. Pterodactyls and pterosaurs are not dinosaurs. You know, swimming marine reptiles like the mosasaurs that Marcus Ross studies, those aren't dinosaurs. Um, and so this is important that we define our terms and think through these things if we're going to get anywhere close to answering this question, what are feathered dinosaurs? Do they exist? How do we think about them? Thank you. All right. Hey, well, thank you so much there, um, Matt, Matt, Dr. McLean. Um, so uh, anyone, if you've got questions, I've got one question here. So let me go ahead and put it up on the screen. So if you guys got questions, go ahead and shoot them uh, to me and uh, I'll try and get them over there. So here's the first question. Let me see here. Um, all right. Can you guys see that? Yes. So why are Rasukians not considered dinosaurs? They look quite similar to Sarisians. Yeah. So um, Rawasukians are a group of extinct reptiles in the Triassic. Um, they are archosaurs, um, along with, like I said, crocodilians and pterosaurs and things like that. Um, their heads superficially look a lot like a big meat-eating theropod, like an allosaurus or a T-Rex or something. They're, they're hyper carnivores. They're eating big stuff. Um, they've got the serrated teeth, just like a dinosaur. Um, but, uh, and they do have a rick posture. So you might be like, oh, wow, that sounds a lot like a dinosaur, right? But Rawasukians are Pseudosuchians. That means they're in the group closer to crocodilians. So one way you can easily tell is if you look at the ankles. Okay, and we didn't talk about ankles yet, but um, dinosaurian ankles, okay, are just a simple hinge, okay? Um, they've got this line between the proximal tarsals with the tibia and then the distal tarsals and the rest of the foot, and it just bends like that, okay? Um, and that's the same thing you find in birds, okay? Um, Pseudosuchians, so crocodiles and their relatives, including the Rawasukians, they have a more complicated hinge, and you'll hear it called something like the crew tarsan ankle or um, the crocodile ankle or different things like that. But basically, the hinge line actually makes like a zigzag, 
it runs like around one of the tarsals and then around the other one. <laughs> it's like this funky little thing. And it's hard at first to picture like, how does this thing even move? But it does. Um, and it works, works well, right? God's designs work well. And um, so they have a fundamentally different way that their foot works back there. And so that's a really good tell that you're like, oh, this is a crocodile like animal pretending to look like a dinosaur, right? It's trying to deceive us, trying to trick us, but it's not actually a dinosaur. Hmm. Okay. Excellent. Fantastic answer. So hold on. I hope that uh, uh, that answered your question. Here's another one. Um, uh, good evening, gentlemen. What would be an example of a creature that strongly resembles a dinosaur but is distinct? So um, we just mentioned Rawasukians. That'd be a good example. Um, there's other fun things like that. Um, and actually, one of our Rawasukian-like animals, Teratosaurus, for a long time was thought to be a dinosaur. Um, and then they later discovered that it wasn't. Um, you have, uh, I mean, there's some other triassic archosaurs like that, like Aedosaurs, which are like armored ones. Um, they got spikes and stuff, so they look a lot like our armored dinosaurs. Um, or uh, the, some of like the Erythrosuchids or different groups like that. Um, Marcus, I don't know if you've got anything that pops into mind. Um, yeah, it's a good question. And I'm not sure if, if they're wondering, is there an example of a living creature um, that's similar to a dinosaur, but distinct? Um, but of course, um, other things that, that Matt had mentioned, you know, there are things that aren't dinosaurs that end up in your bag of dinosaurs from, from uh, dollar plus tree. We'll start calling it that, see if it catches on. Um, you know, the, like the pterosaurs that Matt studies. Uh, lots of people think those are flying dinosaurs. And it turns out, no, they're very, very similar to dinosaurs in a lot of ways. Uh, they're they're one of the most similar groups to dinosaurs, but they've got uh, leg construction, skull constructions that are slightly distinct uh, from them. And of course, the marine reptiles, all the the swimming marine organisms, whether they're the mosasaurs, which are actually in the lizard group, they're actually true lizards, um, and you know would be kind of similar to like a Komodo dragon or a snake, you know, somewhere like in between those two. Um, so even though they're in your book on dinosaurs. Not everything in there uh, is going to be a dinosaur. Your plesiosaurs, your ichthyosaurs are all going to be non-dinosaurian uh, organisms. Mm -hmm. Cool. Excellent. So, um, all right. So why don't we uh, flip over to Marcus? I don't know. Is there anything you want to add, Marcus, to what's been said at all? Oh, I think I think Matt did just fine there. Nothing for me to add on that one. All right. Cool. Okay. So why don't I go ahead and switch you in here? Um, so... Uh, that's your presentation, I believe. Yep. And uh, I'm going to remove myself here. So you go ahead and get started. And again, uh, so for this next section, if anyone has questions, go ahead and stick them up on the screen and I'll try to get them uh, to the speakers. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much, Ken, for the opportunity for Matt and I to, to talk about this. It was really fun for us to be at ICC uh, this past year and you know, for the two of us to be kind of up here giving this presentation, taking a lot of questions, and uh, there's just loads of really great um, conversation that happened uh, at that. I really appreciate the audience. Uh, we probably had 250 some odd people, maybe 300 in the uh, in the auditorium at the time. So uh, really good pointed questions. So if you've got some questions out there and you're wondering, hey, you know, this is your chance to talk to a couple of uh, creation paleontologists. So definitely uh, hop in there. Thanks for the questions so far. So I'm going to take the next two topics, but again, there'll be a break in between them. Uh, the first part that we're going to be looking at here are what is a feather, right? So kind of the, the impetus behind bringing this presentation is there's, there's a lot of controversy amongst creationists about whether or not dinosaurs have fossils because people are worried that if, oh, sorry, if dinosaurs have feathers, uh, not fossils, uh, if dinosaurs have feathers, because evolutionists have said that's evidence that dinosaurs evolved into birds, for example. And um, what Matt and I were trying to, to do with this is to say, well, we can we can still look at the data and the data could say yes or no. My my old uh, PhD advisor, uh, Dr. David Fostovsky, was talking to me about my research one time and he said, you know, the answer could be this, the answer could be that, and either answer is interesting. And I thought that was just so insightful that, you know, here he was, he had a particular way that he thought the data were going to fall out. But if they didn't, it would surprise him and he would find that interesting. So that that is you know, some of what we're trying to bring here as we explore this, do dinosaurs have feathers or not? So the first thing that we need to know is what is in fact a dinosaur? And Matt has walked us through some of those physical attributes that help us know what is and isn't a dinosaur. And so my task here now is gonna be, well, what is a feather? And, and that 
intuitively you go, well, I know what feather is. And it's like, well, we do, but there's also some really interesting stuff about feathers and types of feathers that we don't ever think about or really see. So a feather scientifically is what we consider to be an integumentary structure. And what that means is it grows up out of the skin. So skin is integument. It's sitting out on top of the muscles uh, and things like that. And it's therefore anchored to the skin and not to the bone. So when you find feathers in the fossil record on a bird, for example, they'll go close to the bone, but not exactly onto the bone. That's not where they're coming from. They're, they're not bony material. Uh, they are hollow structures um, that follow up, you know, more or less kind of a hierarchical branching. You can think of, uh, for some of you math nerds, fractals, right? How it branches this way and this way. And it's kind of the same sort of branching, just getting smaller and smaller. Feathers do a lot of the same thing. They're hollow all the way through, both at the base and out towards the very tips of the, of the feather. And they're composed primarily of what's called keratin. That's a type of protein. And in particular, they are composed of what's called beta keratin. So keratin is a, a group of proteins that can be arranged in different kinds of ways. Alpha keratins um, are built uh, by us, for example. Um, our fingernails, our hair are built out of things called alpha keratins. And that's when the keratin structures are built in like these helices, these kind of spiral staircase structures. Feathers are made of keratin, but their arrangement is different. They build keratin with these really strong bonds between the keratin molecules, and then they stack them like plates, a whole bunch of them. And they're really uh, tight. A, a recent paper that was just published about two weeks ago uh, is kind of redefining the terms and calling them corneaceous uh, beta keratins. They're, they're getting kind of specific here. Everybody's just called them beta keratins for a long time. But in any event, they're recognizing there is a structural difference in the way that beta keratins are made compared to alpha keratins. So claws and hair, yeah, they're made of keratin, but it's not the same construction of keratin that we see for things like feathers. And so uh, feathers, I, I have a slight error here. It's not that they have no alpha keratin. They have sometimes some alpha keratin, but it's, it's almost all these beta keratin plates that are being constructed together to form feathers. Now that's going to be important later on because it turns out that there are some preserved biomolecules out there on some of these fossils. And if they're composed of alpha or beta keratins, that might help us figure out, are we looking at real feathers? Or are we looking at something else? So modern feathers are beta keratins, branching structures, they're hollow in the center. So here's a couple of uh, different illustrations taken from the Cornell Bird Academy of uh, different types of feathers. Uh, we're very familiar with wing feathers. Um, and some of you might even know a saga by that name, just a little joke for especially the folks who like some of the homeschool work out there. But anyway, the wing feathers are asymmetrical. They're not mirrored with a center. Uh, rather, than the, rather than that, the uh, shaft of the feather is towards the front and then you've got a longer uh, set of filaments on the side. So short filaments out front, longer filaments on the side. It's not running straight down the center. And that's for uh, aerodynamic purposes. This helps with the airfoil that is the bird wing and for creating lift um, on, the, on the wing surface. Even on the tails, um, we've got a tail feather here. The tail feathers towards the very center of the tail are symmetrical but the ones towards the edges actually look a little bit like wing feathers in that they are not symmetrical, especially if they are helping the bird to fly. So you've got those types of feathers and those are what we often think about feathers. Um, we often remember down feathers also. These are the feathers that are deep underneath and inside uh, or close to the body and they're keeping the bird warm. They're fuzzy, fluffy, kind of chaotic. The fibers are going everywhere. And they're really good at trapping air in between all of those fibers and keeping the bird's body warm. And that's very important because birds actually run at higher body temperatures than mammals do, right? Our normal body temperature is 98.6, give or take. Um, and mammals can be a little bit lower than that, some a little bit warmer than that, but you know, we're, we're almost all in, in the, uh, yeah, we're all in the 90s pretty much. Birds, on the other hand, are typically running around like 103, 104, 105 degrees. Their, their body is tuned at a higher temperature. All their enzymes, their proteins operate at these higher temperatures that for us would actually be rather dangerous. And so they need to keep in their body heat in order to maintain their body temperature. Down is really, really good at this. What are some of the other ones? So we got the wing and the tail feathers. We got the down feathers. 
of contour feathers. You've probably seen these as well, sometimes uh, shed by the birds because as uh, feathers are in the skin, they regrow and so they will drop their feathers. You'll, you've probably heard of the term molting, right? So they molt the feathers, they release them out. Contour feathers are the feathers that cover the body of the bird. They're over the chest, the abdomen, they're over parts of the face, uh, along with these things called semi-plume, which you know, are kind of halfway between a contour and a down sort of thing. So you can see we've got kind of a range. Then out on the right-hand side, we have these bristle feathers and phylo plumes. These are the ones that are really interesting and kind of weird because they're like single shafts, just like the center of uh, a wing or a tail feather, for example. Um, and with the bristles, they have a couple of little fuzzies down at the very base, but it's pretty much kind of like a hair. And for a lot of animals, they're, they're around the face. And so they operate kind of like whiskers in a sense. They're sensory connected. There's going to be a bunch of nerves towards the base of those uh, that will allow them to feel the movement of the wind or you know, directions and things like that. Uh, Phyloplume are interesting. They're a long, uh, they're a long single uh, bit of feather up until the end, and then it just tucks out a tiny little bit. And these are buried in and amongst all of the contour feathers. Scientists aren't entirely sure what their full purpose is, but it's probably for keeping track of how the rest of the feathers are doing. Uh, maybe acting as a sensory device there, like hairs in the middle of them that might be able to sense, oh, I've got an insect uh, that's crawling on, on me or something like that. So here we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different feather types that are all found on any given modern bird. Uh, just about every bird is going to have all of these. The only exception might be um, symmetrical wing feathers not being found on birds that are flightless for example, or a, something like a penguin is going to have a very different sort of feather. You know, so just uh, to orient them on the body again, uh, we've got our remiges and reticies. Those words in blue uh, refer to the wing feathers, remiges, and the reticies, that's a science term for the tail feathers. The body feathers and the phylo plume, you know, out there again in the, on the chest area of the animal, bristles out towards the face, and then your um, down, another one called powder down, a specialized version of the down feather that tend to shed a lot. Um, and they, they produce large amounts of, um, you know, kind of like dandruff in a sense, like feather dandruff. And, um, you know, that, that might be uh, for kind of housekeeping, keeping things clean and, and stuff like that. So these are you know, another example of where these different types of feathers are going to be. So we typically kind of define or divide the feathers into the veined ones, which are going to be our flight feathers on the wings and uh, the ones on the tail, the remiges and the reticies. These have the vein. And again, the vein on the, um, on the wing feathers is off towards the front. The ones on the tails can be either towards the side or down the middle. And then the body feathers are always straight down the middle. And we refer to these as closed feathers because they have a little hook and grab system, uh, what's called a hook and barbule. It's basically a little loop and a little hook, and it acts a lot like Velcro to hold the, the feather in a particular shape. And, and if you're a kid and you've, you remember picking up a feather that you found at the playground or out of the driveway or the backyard or you found a nest, right? These are the sorts of ones that you can kind of muss them all up and then draw your finger across them and then they, they go back. And that's the hooks and the barbs that are able to easily release, but also hook back together again. On the body, um, the body feathers don't have barbules, though, um, especially for those that we see in flightless birds. I've got a picture here of a cassowary feather. So cassowaries are uh, these flightless birds from places like Indonesia. Uh, they have a nasty disposition. They're really <laughs> terrifying animals, actually. They're about the size of a person. They have this big, huge spike on their foot that's like a six inch long claw. Uh, they even have um, these modified um, feathers that are just the, the veins and they're hooked. So they look like three, three or four claws coming off of the, uh, of the feather itself. And, and actually they also have a couple of very tiny claws uh, at the end of their fingers that are making up the, uh, the wing structure or the bone of the wing structure. But what's really cool here is their body feathers have a vein that splits off and creates a V shape, which is really neat. And you can hopefully see here that there's a lot of space between the bristles on either side of the veins. 
And uh, that's because these ones don't have that hook and barbule system to keep it all together. So they can fray around quite a bit uh, because the animal's not flying. It doesn't need to have its feathers stay as a nice tight pack around the body because it's not, you know, it's not experiencing uh, cooling from flying through the air like other birds do. The, the feathers that don't have veins are things like the down. And so here's a nice close up of your down feathers. And you can see that just chaos. Uh, there's one little nub of what would grow into a vein if it was a different type of feather. But this is the little anchor point in the skin. And if you've got a nice down feather or down comforter, this is the part that occasionally pokes you. Um, it sticks, sticks through the cloth and, and hits you. Um, so it's an open structure as opposed to a closed one. There's no hook and barbules at all anywhere. Everything just frays out in these little branching structures. Um, powder down sheds this material and semi-plume um, has a very mild rachis uh, in it. And then it kind of gets uh, fluffy like this, but again, halfway between say something like down and the body uh, contour feathers. Uh, here's a nice uh, image of some of those uh, bristle feathers. So these are the ones that have um, basically just a single hair coming out straight from them. And these are very uh, prominent on large birds. So you can see these on ostriches. If you look around their eyes, they look like these big eyelashes. Yeah, basically they are. They're feathers uh, instead of hair performing the function of eyelashes. And in uh, smaller birds like these flycatchers, uh, we see them um, extend out pretty far probably acting again like whiskers as these sort of sensory devices because flycatchers literally do catch fly. These are animals that fly through the air to get their uh, insects. And so they're fast, they're highly maneuverable, and they're probably using these feathers uh, to help with directionality and quick movements as they fly through, uh, fly through the air. Okay, so the next thing that I want us to take a look at is what is it that feathers look like when we find them on fossil birds. So this is a image of a fossil bird uh, called Hongangornis, a uh, longa cresta. So longi cresta means long crest. Yeah, it's got a big long crest going up over the top of its head. Not so easy to see maybe here, um, but right around where the letters N-O and N-A are, just underneath one, each of those, you might be able to see some light fibrous sort of gray, uh, slightly darker, than the gray around, uh, say, to the left of the NO. So just underneath that and to the right, you see these uh, fibers. These are feathers. These are going to be things like contour feathers that are over the face and the body. These aren't the wing feathers. These aren't the, the ones that have a really strong vein. Um, and when they all get uh, compressed during the process of fossilization, it ends up looking like a lot of hair if you will, there's, it gets kind of matted. Uh, there's also some towards the bottom around the throat where the two white lines uh, pinch out at the bottom of the V. You can see some dark material down there. That's also impressions of feathers that are in the throat area. This is a very, very well-preserved fossil bird uh, from the lower Cretaceous units of China. So this is important because if we want to know whether dinosaurs have feathers, we also not only need to know what dinosaurs are, and what feathers are. We also need to know what feathers look like when they're fossilized on birds, right? We want, we want to make sure, first off, we've got birds and we know that they're birds. And therefore, then we can say, okay, this must be what a feather looks like when it's been fossilized. Well, how do we know that they're birds, right? Well, for the most part, that's skeletons. And uh, in a lot of the cases, most of the cases in the paleontological record, we don't have feathers on birds um, it, as fossils. The, the fossil uh, the feathers are just delicate and uh, they're you know, the process of fossilization didn't keep them. So, for example, here is a fossil bird that comes from Poland in Oligocene rock units. And uh, its name is Ava Raptor, Ava Lap Raptor of Longa Cruz. And um, it's um, it's from a modern family, uh, the Asipteridae. And these are the, you know, this is part of the group of birds of prey. So things like eagles and uh, hawks and stuff like that this is one of the families that includes those. So this one has no feathers. So how do we know that it's a bird? Well, um, it turns out that there's a lot of really good skeletal pieces that are preserved here. And down below, you can see in this gray box that there's a, a drawing of the skeleton and there's all these letters around here. That's where the scientist identifies the various different types of bones 
that are found on that organism. And so, you know, what are the sorts of things that we're going to see in birds that we're not going to see in other sorts of things? Uh, well, you know, we're going to be looking at things like um, the hand area. The hand area of a bird you've seen at any you know, Thanksgiving dinner, right? Sticks out there. In fact, I just had turkey for dinner. We had a whole turkey. And so there's, there's that really sharp wing uh, at the end. And that's a fusion of bones in the hand and the wrist. Uh, in, in paleontology, we call this a carpo metacarpus, which means a wrist bone plus hand, uh, hand and wrist bone stuff, carpo metacarpus. It's all fused in together. There's a lot of bones all kind of tight. Also at the foot, uh, Dr. Matt McLean had mentioned the ankle of dinosaurs and birds has this simple hinge, this nice straight line pivot. And uh, the the foot bone area of a bird is what we call a tarso metatarsus. It's the, the midfoot bones, like the, the middle part of your foot, um, along with some of the ankle bones. They're all kind of fused in together. It makes for a single long strip and then three toes stick out or four toes stick out from that. So a tarso metatarsus is going to be found around the leg and a carpo metacarpus is going to be found at the hand. You're also going to have a large plate-like sternum, typically with a keel, a, a, a vertical uh, spire coming out of it. And that's where muscles to operate the wings are going to anchor. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other stuff as well. Um, but, you know, that gets, I think, us to the idea of the sorts of things that we would see carving a Thanksgiving turkey, right? You, you've got that breastbone that separates the two big halves of breast meat, and that's the sternum with its keel. And then you can take a look at the carpal metacarpus. Um, you probably won't see the tarso metatarsus because uh, they cut that part off. And uh, that's like the chicken foot or the, the turkey foot. And that's not there. You know, you've, you've got that lopped off so that you start at the drumstick, which is actually the, the tibia. That's your, your lower leg area. That's what you're seeing with the, the birds there. So these are the sorts of things that we're expecting to see from modern birds and from uh, fossil birds. And so if we have something like uh, hung ornus over here, you might say, okay, how do you know it's a bird? It's because of the anatomy of modern birds that we can see in this fossil and the anatomy of modern birds we can see even in fossil birds that don't have any feathers. So uh, that brings us to uh, a pause on this one, Ken. We're ready to hop back in and take any questions. Okay, excellent. So let me bring you guys back up and uh, I'll just leave that. Uh, oh, hang on, let me remove that as well. So um, anyone, I don't have any questions up right now. If anyone has any questions, go ahead and ask them. Uh, I do have a question and uh, that would relate to, you know, we saw all those different uh, feathery structures. Uh, so in the fossil record, uh, when it comes to dinosaurs, do we see the same kinds of uh, feathers with dinosaurs? Yeah, we're coming to that uh, as a matter of fact. Okay. And so, okay. yeah, the... As, as we're going to come into the next one, the answer is going to be, yeah, we do see um, not just one feather type, but a variety of different types of feathers. And we might not be able to identify all of, say, the seven or eight feather types that are found on modern birds in dinosaurs, but mostly that's because of preservation. That's because the feathers get matted down on top of one another, and you can't always pick out one feather from another. Sometimes you get something beautiful like Archaeopteryx, where you can see all the individual wing feathers. But then around the body, there's just so many feathers, it's just fuzz. It's, it's just one on top of the other. It would be like trying to pick out single strands of hair on a mammal fossil. Um, only around the edges can you do that. When you get around the, the body itself, it's impossible. Yeah, excellent. Okay, I've got some questions coming in. Let me just pop this one up there. Um, so were there feathered dinosaurs that could fly? Hmm. Yes, and yes, there were feathered dinosaurs, and there are some that could actually fly. Um, we're going to be looking at a couple of really <laughs> crazy, crazy dinosaurs uh, here in the next unit. So I'll hold my powder on that one, my powder down, I guess, uh, on that one. And um, we'll, we'll be looking at uh, a couple that, yes, could fly. Okay, cool. Is a couple one others here? that could glide or, you know, that sort of thing. You had some that were fairly weak. You had other ones that were definitely flitting from tree to tree uh, around. Okay, excellent. Here's another question. 
It's possible that some dinosaurs lost their feathers when they grew and were replaced by scales. That's a really good question. Um, it's, it's certainly possible. What's, what's interesting is that there's been several papers uh, recently, and actually uh, Dr. Matt McQueen had pointed me to a, a paper in a, a big compendium book about feather construction and things like this. And the um, and some other recent papers that have come out, it's just really interesting what has been going on in terms of research. Um, the gene sets to produce feathers versus scales in birds turn out to be the same things, tweaked in different ways. So this is why you can have, say, um, chicken breeds that have scaly uh, scaly feet versus crazy feather feet. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of some of the of the chicken breeds out there that have like these giant feather dusters for feet. It's unnatural. Um, this is the result of sin in the fall. We, we shouldn't be doing this. This animal's unfit. Um, but <laughs> they're, they're kind of like- People show uh, those birds, you know, they have like these competitions. So he's got the most feathery feet. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing what humans will value. Uh, <laughs> when, when we get really bored, it's like, yeah, can you imagine how this whole got, thing got started with my feathers? My chicken's got more feathers on his feet than yours does. I can, mm -hmm. I can build a, a chicken that's made of nothing but feather. Right? Mm -hmm. and, I watched a show on that, and I'll tell you, it was fascinating. <laughs> Some of these different feathery adaptations that these uh, different uh, chickens had. There's, uh, a, there's a book you should get called Extraordinary Chickens, and it's mainly okay, just photos of all these different breeds of chickens and the wild things that, like the different ways that they look. Okay, there's the plug for that book. Go ahead and read it. Yeah, we, right, we raised chickens for a little while, but the only thing I cared about was eggs. I really like, you know, I don't care what color the chicken is. I don't care what color the egg is. I just want there to be an egg um, and, and a larger one, if at all possible. So we got uh, we got Rhode Island Reds and uh, Leghorn Crosses, and they gave you big old eggs almost every day. They Some of them twice a day. Um, yeah. Every once in a while, you, you get a, 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 a duplicate. But um, yeah, so it turns out that the, the genes that control feather development on birds are also the genes that control scale development. And there's other regulatory genes that are feeding into that to determine basically whether or not you could put a scale or a feather here. And so mm -hmm. theoretically, you know, we could probably end up with chickens that were all scales. Uh, and what a terrifying thought that is. That is very scary. But from, from a production standpoint, you know, hey, then you don't have to uh, defeather the chickens. Uh, you know, you don't have to uh, pluck them. Uh, but right. then again, then you're dealing with like this armored chicken that I'm not sure anybody would buy. So yeah. I, I don't know. Let's not give people ideas. <laughs> That's fascinating. The pendulum has got to swing the other way sometimes, Matt, right? We got too many feathers. <laughs> now we're going to get nothing but scale of chickens. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. I didn't know that about the scales. I know they had scales on their feet, but I didn't know that that was so close that that uh, connection between feathers and scales. Uh, yeah. You often see so some scales around their eyes as well. If you look real close. Right. Okay. But the Very skin good. itself is, is soft. You know, it, uh, the skin itself is non scaly. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well, look, let's go uh, uh, back to Matt. So uh, Matt, if you can stick your presentation up here. Actually, I'll and, be, I'll be taking the middle one, Ken. Oh, uh, you're taking this one. Yeah. And then Matt's going to okay. close it. Okay, no worries. Then I will put your presentation back up here and uh, I will say goodbye. I mean, just for the time being and let you go for it. So don't forget, right. everyone, uh, if you've got questions, uh, get ready for them. Go ahead and, and uh, stick your questions there. And also for those who are watching uh, afterwards, so we've got the live session. This is going to be recorded. Go ahead and uh, uh, pound the like button and uh, uh, hit that subscribe button and ring the bell as well for easier access to more videos as they come along. Got to get that plug in there. Okay, I'm going to put you on now. Sounds good. Hey, thanks. And yes, do subscribe to Creation Unfolding. This channel is awesome. Really, really enjoy it. Ken, you do a fantastic job with your videos. So keep them coming. We, we appreciate them. All right, so our third topic. Now, we've covered dinosaur anatomy and identification. We've covered what feathers look like on modern birds and what they look like when we see them as fossils. So now the question is, what do we see with dinosaurs and the presumed feathers or feather-like structures that have been talked about uh, by many people on these? So Matt talked about cladograms and cladistics as a way of organizing uh, and taxonomy. So here is a big old cladogram of a bunch of different dinosaurian uh, families and groups. Um, Dinosauria, you can see towards uh, the left-hand side in the center of uh, kind of this big branch, you see Dinosauria. 
Up above that is going to be the group of ornithis ornithischians. That's going to be things like your duck-billed dinosaurs, uh, your horned dinosaurs, your armored stuff, uh, those types of dinosaurs. Below that is the Sarischia, which at least traditionally has had the long neck sauropods, the first branch to the top on that one. Uh, and then your theropods, which is everything else below that. So we'll see how the how the cladograms sort out, but this is this is still you know uh, one of the consensus perspectives out there. So what's on the right hand side are silhouettes of different dinosaurs, so you get a sense of what their overall shape for the family group or what have you looks like, and then a bunch of different images right next to them uh, on their left. Uh, the set where there's lots of little gray balls means that we've got some evidence of skin impressions and it's scaly. Okay, so what we have of these organisms indicates scaly type of skin, the type of scales that we see on uh, crocodilians, uh, things like chicken feet that we were just talking about, not the sort of scales that you see on um, a lizard. So Matt had mentioned that he's got a, uh, a lizard at home. I do as well. I've got a skink, uh, which means I have a tiny lizard uh, compared to the bearded dragon that he's got, but nonetheless, uh, <laughs> two, two paleontologists who like their modern reptiles. But their scales look different from what we see on crocodilians, uh, dinosaur skin, and, uh, and even bird skin, things like that. So the little gray balls mean scale impressions are known from that group. Uh, then we see things like the little blue, almost looks like a spider. Uh, that's where there's tophaceous material. It looks kind of like down uh, on them. And you can see that there's one blue up towards the top in this animal called calindrodromius. And then there's another blue by, oh, wow the Tyrannosauroidea, that's the family that includes T-Rex. And then um, in a bunch of the other ones, we have uh, some other kind of uh, little branches, some uh, tan feathers, and then towards the very bottom, it looks like what, what seem to be kind of modern wing feathers, okay? So all of that is uh, shown on the left side in the types of integument box. So a variety of different types of integuments found from a wide array of the dinosauria, the Ornithischians, the uh, theropods, and so far only the sauropoda is the only like major group that seems to only have scales known uh, from them at this time. So let's take a look at some of those saurischian dinosaurs, in particular the theropods, the meat-eating dinosaurs. So we're going to kind of follow this cladogram a little bit and look at some of the different material that has been discovered. So this one's listed as a non-manoraptoran. Uh, let me just go back uh, two slides here. The Manoraptorans are, let's see, if you look at, um, if you look at where the Tyrannosauroidea was, the T-Rex, which has got that blue spider looking thing next to it, um, you drop down one more from there and you get to Manoraptor morpha, Manoraptor formis, Manoraptora. Okay, all that means is animals that are similar to the raptors in various sorts of ways. Manoraptora, uh, means hand snatchers or hand thieves, uh, if you will, thieves. And uh, it includes the classic things like Velociraptor, and it's going to include a bunch of others. But there are dinosaurs outside of that group that seem to have some fuzzy integument as well. So the first of these um, is this animal called Sayuromimus. Uh, its name actually means squirrel mimic. Not because it really looks anything like a squirrel, but actually because the whole thing was really, really fuzzy. It's a fairly small um, uh, theropod dinosaur. It's not very large, but it had this giant thick tail, which is uh, partially visible on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, you can see that there's kind of this black line um, to the left of the tail. And from that black line to the tail is nothing but fuzz, large amounts of fuzz. And so C and D there are zones that I zoomed in on. So you could see kind of these fibrous materials moving uh, from top to bottom. And you'll notice uh, on D below, you've got a couple of large white blobs there. Those are the vertebrae. So those are the, the backbones and little spines coming up vertically from this, the backbone. And then these fibers start just a little bit above that. And that makes sense uh, because these are fibers that are coming out of the skin. Feathers are integument, right? They're coming up out of the skin. Uh, likewise, in C, the fibers just above the vertebrae uh, start just over, you know, just atop those little neural spines. So they seem to be in the right place. This is an animal that might be part of what's called the megalosaurids. That's actually one of the first dinosaurs 
uh, ever discovered, Megalosaurus. Um, we're not entirely sure if it belongs to that because it's um, juvenile. And so some of its bones haven't fully grown into position. So there's some question that it's exactly where it goes. But nonetheless, we know that it's not, say, one of the raptor groups. It's, its skull is very different from that. Some of the feet and the hand components are very different from that. So um, we've got something here, and it's so fuzzy with this huge, thick, fuzzy tail that it was called squirrel mimic because it was like, that's a squirrel tail on a dinosaur. Well, we've got a couple of tyrannosauroids, too. So tyrannosauroidea is the uh, uh, superfamily or order uh, in which the tyrannosaurus and its ilk are all found in. Um, one of the animals that is uh, found in this group, we think, is uh, an animal called Delong. It's from lower Cretaceous units in China. And DeLong was found uh, with a lot of its skeleton. You can see all the white skeletal pieces on the top. Those are all the bones that were recovered from the skeleton. So quite a bit. And there was a whole bunch of fuzz and fluff found around it. So I've zoomed in on one component of part of the tailbone. So, or bones, I should say, in the tail. And you can see these darkened lines kind of sweeping from right to left. And those are fuzzy integument of some kind that are located along the tail. And there was more of that around the leg bones. Uh, there was some of that around uh, the left arm and some of that around the face. So they've reconstructed this as an animal that's kind of fuzzy all around uh, because if you're finding it on the legs and the tail and the arms and somewhere around the face, chances are it's got fuzz pretty much everywhere. Um, so especially along the tail and the left mandible. Mandible is uh, the lower jawbone. So your lower left jawbone had a bunch of it. That's why they give a little extra fuzz uh, to it in that illustration. So this thing probably part of the Tyrannosauroid group. Um, Euteranus certainly is. And uh, this is known from three skeletons that were all found together. Uh, potentially a good indicator of a rapid and catastrophic burial of three different animals all kind of caught up together. And uh, Euteranus is pretty good size, um, seven to nine meters long. So we're talking about a, you know, roughly 23 to 30 foot long animal. This, that's big. That's as big as, you know, Allosaurus uh, for the most part. And, uh, but it's a Tyrannosauroid called Euteranus, also coming from lower Cretaceous rocks of China. And this one had very densely packed filaments, some of them as much as 15 centimeters long. So, you know, that's about six inches, uh, give or take. Uh, some people, especially in creationism, had said, you know, maybe these are uh, fibers of collagen. Uh, collagen is the connective tissue that's underneath your skin, for example, that lets your skin move around, but not move around too far. And uh, when an animal dies, that collagen might be able to fray out a little bit, but the collagen is not going to be that long on an animal. Otherwise, its skin is going to be all saggy and droopy. It's going to look like couple of different dog breeds. Probably not what was going on with the dinosaurs. Their skin's going to be a little more tight to their body. And so we've got these nice long branching filaments around the face, the arms, the legs, and the tail. And they're typically a couple of centimeters, but upwards of 15, 16, 17 centimeters long. So this seems to be an animal that is covered in a lot of fuzz. And it's a big animal. This, this isn't small. This is a, a good size animal. And so you might be wondering, you know, well, what are you going to use this for? And it's, they're not using it to fly. This animal is not flying. But think back to the types of feathers that we looked at, right? Only two feather types were used directly for flight. And those were the remiges and the redices, the, the wing feathers and the tail feathers. The rest of the feathers on the bird body are used for uh, coloration and species identification. Uh, for male-female identification, right? Now you see different um, members of the same species and the males and the females have different colors. Think of cardinals. Um, it's going to be used for thermal regulation to keep in heat. So these are all the sorts of things that feathers are function, you know, as far as what they do. That's their function is to do a variety of different sorts of things. So Euteranus has got what seems to be a large amount of uh, fibrous filamentous plumage on its body and it's probably helping it to know are you part of my species or not we don't know if they're also using it for male female identification probably helping to keep the animals warm because dinosaurs were warm blooded so they need to keep their their temperatures maintained that means they've got to keep their heat in another um really interesting uh group of dinosaurs that have feathers uh or at least kind of what seem to be fibrous 
feathery integument uh, are the group that are called the Therizinosaurs. Now, if you saw uh, Jurassic World Dominion, the last movie that came out, uh, you have my condolences. Uh, it was not a great movie. Um, there were two plot lines and neither of them were really good. But the dinosaurs were fantastic. I mean, they were so, so good. And the grouchiest, grumpiest dinosaur in the whole movie is this big, ponderous Therizinosaurus. Um, and the first thing that you see it do is just swipe a deer out of existence for no good reason. Because these animals are herbivores. Even though they're in the, the meat-eating dinosaur group, they're kind of like the pandasauruses. They are dumpy and not fast and ponderous. And they've got these big, long claws on their hands, mostly for like gathering and shredding vegetation and eating plants. Um, and Bepiosaurus is one of these members. And it has a huge amount of fibrous material on its body. Um, this is all that's known from Bepiosaurus. Uh, there might be a few other bones here and there, but it's, it's kind of like this big plate that's got the skull, the neck going to about the shoulder area and some of the arm. Um, the rest of the skeleton uh, was not collected. Uh, I think it might've been destroyed in a, in a quarry, but I can't remember exactly. But there's a couple of, of uh, close-ups uh, on these uh, bones, a few other pieces here and there, some parts of the neck, and you can see these uh, blackish brown fibers coming off from the vertebrae that are on the right and in, in the part of B, the fibers are coming off towards the left. Um, these material, uh, these uh, areas of the fossil were actually sampled and a chemical assay was done on them. And it turned out that they were made of keratin. Okay. So remember that keratin is the material that makes up hair and fingernails and claws on things like mammals. Um, and is also the material that makes up uh, feathers on birds. We had two types. We have alpha keratin and beta keratin. So this stuff was sampled and actually both alpha and beta keratins were found, primarily alpha keratins. As it turns out, there was a paper that came out last week or the week before. I was just uh, reading it. Um, and uh, it's a paper by, oh, let me just uh, pull up the names here. Yeah, uh, Slater et al. And it was published in Nature, Ecology, and Evolution. Uh, just um, I guess, yeah, it was published uh, in September, so just, just a couple of weeks ago. And they did a, a fascinating experiment where they took modern feathers from birds and they heated them up to temperatures like 200 to 250 degrees Celsius uh, in order to simulate the temperatures that these types of fossils would have experienced during the process of fossilization, right? So this animal goes in as bone and other th stuff it's subjected to heat, subjected to pressure. There's mineral replacement that happens. And uh, the temperatures are rather high. They're, they're like oven hot uh, for this stuff. So 250 degrees Celsius is like 450 degrees. So they baked modern feathers at these temperatures and then they ran chemical analyses. And what they found is that at, high, at the higher temperature at 250 degrees, the beta keratin structure of modern feathers broke apart into alpha keratin parts. And so they went back and, and were evaluating some other evolutionist hypotheses. Some evolutionists said, well, maybe feathers started out as being made of alpha keratins and later the beta keratin system evolved. And these authors who are evolutionists as well looked at this and said, nope, that's not what's happening. It turns out that the process of fossilization is degrading the protein and going from alpha to beta. It, it's kind of unraveling and, and forming a simpler structure. And basically their argument is, nope, um, the feather material is the same exact stuff in the fossil record because what we see chemically from the fossils matches almost exactly what we did in the lab when we just baked a bunch of feathers. Um, in one sense, a simple experiment, but then you have to do the chemical identification part. That's not so simple. And uh, I think from a creation perspective, this is really cool because it makes sense. Like feathers have been feathers. And the earliest evidence that we have of feathers, feathers are still feathers, right? The fibers and whatnot, they're made of the same exact stuff. So we know that these structures are made of keratin. And we now know from experimental research that if we look at them and say, oh, but they're alpha keratin, well, that's because fossilization does damage to things. Uh, and in this case, heat and, and high temperatures does damage to the, to the um, feathers. And interestingly, they, they checked them against bird feathers as well. And they found that some bird feathers, 
from the Green River Formation, which is uh, up above dinosaur bearing units, they had fewer beta keratins. They, they'd have been subjected to higher temperatures than the stuff in China had. And so the dinosaur stuff, which should have been more primitive, according to the um, according to the theory, and would have been only alpha keratins. Now, they actually had plenty of beta keratins more than the actual bird fossils. So uh, again, I think good, interesting argument uh, with creation that feathers have always been feathers and made of the same things that we see modern feathers made of. And they're found in this animal, Bepiosaurus, this panda dinosaur. This was, um, this is one of the, the coolest ones here. And, and for me, it's a, historically important because I, I was skeptical um, as a grad student about dinosaurs having feathers. Um, when I was in grad school, starting in 1999 through uh, 2005, the, the first early years when a couple of feathered dinosaur fossils were coming out of China, the evidence was, you know, it was okay. Um, it it might've been fairly strong, but I didn't think that it was completely compelling. And there were only a couple of taxa, and there were a couple of paleontologists who were saying, nope, these aren't feathers. And so there was a, a there was good room for discussion and debate on this. There was good room for them for there to be a difference of opinion on these things. All that changed, at least for me, with the discovery of Microraptor um, and the discovery of full skeletons of Microraptor. Microraptor was an animal that was first identified from a partial skeleton. We recognized that it was a a little raptor dinosaur. It's in the same family as Dromaeosaurus and Deinonychus and Velociraptor. It's got that cool little raptor claw, and it's a small one, right? It's micro raptor. It's about the size of a crow with a tail, a long tail, and it's got a long bony tail, but it was completely covered with feathers. Um, when, when full skeletons came out a few years after its initial description, new specimens were found, and it was covered head to toe in these beautiful, long flight feathers not just fuzz or fibers or things like that, but, but feathers that were clearly adapted to being able to at least glide through the air. The animal didn't have very strong muscles. It didn't have a big keel with a stern on their sternum or anything like that. So it was probably a very weak flyer. Just getting from one tree to the, to the next was enough work. Certainly wasn't going to be migrating. This is an image of uh, some of the Microraptor fossils subjected to um, ultraviolet light um, and, and kind of they sort of almost fluoresce and you take pictures of these and, and you can see these long dark lines going again, all the way close to the bones and not quite, they get to the skin. And uh, this animal is really cool because it had feathers all along its legs along with its arms. So it was doing that like weird feathered chicken thing, only not feather dusters at the end of its feet, but like feathers that might've been able to actually help with direction during times of flight. Um, really, really interesting. For a while, people thought maybe it flew like a biplane with a stack of wings and then another stack of wings. That anatomically doesn't really work. Uh, it's more like it's got its wings, its, its arms and wings spread out, and the other ones are going kind of straight to the back um, and probably operating a bit kind of like a, an airfoil or, or kind of uh, the vertical spine on an airplane. So in 19, uh, in, uh, in 2003 or so, when Microraptor was announced and here were the new fossils, I went, all right, you know, it's definitely a dinosaur. I knew anatomically it, it checked all those boxes that Dr. Matt McLean was talking about and a bunch more to be more specific to being a raptor dinosaur. And yet it, here it was head to toe with beautiful feathers and they got lots of specimens of this now. Um, so that, that really did it for me. And uh, here's a picture of, of one of those, uh, not under UV light, but uh, you can see the, the feathers coming off of the arms and um, towards the middle there is where some of those feathers are coming off of the legs. And if you follow the tail down, you see that the tail also has this set of feathers coming off of it. So in a little bit of a tiny fan of feathers. And uh, it also is preserved well enough that we can see the little color bodies that are inside the feathers. These are called melanosomes. And we now know based on the structure of those melanosomes, or at least we, we infer from what we see there, that Microraptor would have looked like a crow in that black iridescent purple blue color stuff. It's really, really cool. And there's more and more dinosaurs and more and more birds uh, that have these melanosomes preserved. Um, I was at a scientific meeting when the first of these was uncovered and it was a fossil from uh, a fossil bird coming from Germany in what's called the Messel Shale. And uh, they were able to identify the melanosomes, these little color dot, uh, color bodies, they're like little balls or rods. 
and the different shapes indicate different color types that are be found on birds. So we can see this with modern birds. We look at their feathers under a microscope and we can see these little, little structures and they're the ones controlling color. And so they said, hey, we were able to identify these in this bird fossil from Germany in the Messel Shale. And we all kind of like our jaws dropped because for the first time ever, this actually meant that we could know some of the colors of fossil animals, right? Until then, it was guesswork. We didn't know if the dinosaurs were, you know, green or purple or whatever. We figured they probably weren't purple. They're probably green and gray, right? We had all these bland sorts of ideas, but now it's like, no, wait, like real color for these fossils. So, I mean, some of the preservation here is just astonishing. We also can tell sometimes that animals had fossils, uh, sorry, that animal, uh, animals had feathers, even when there's no feathers preserved. So this was a fossil bone of Velociraptor that was recovered from the American Museum of Natural History's excursion to, Mongol to Mongolia back in the 1920s. And some scientists went back and in 2007, they published a paper looking at one of these bones from this historic collection. And they found that there were these little bumps on the forearm bone of Velociraptor, where these little white lines are on the gray image in uh, the upper part here. So you got the, the very top is the ulna, the, the whole picture of the ulna, that's your forearm bone right over here. So Velociraptor's forearm bone, the gray is a, another image of it, and they've got these little white lines pointing to these little bumps that are pretty regularly spaced. You can see that these are pretty evenly spaced from one to another. The next two images are from a modern turkey vulture. So turkey vulture is a really big bird. We have loads of them around where I live here in Virginia, and uh, you know their wingspan can be three and a half, four feet, five feet wide. Um, and they have these little bumps on their forearm as well. These bumps are ways in which the bone actually grows to provide additional support to the feathers. So what I've said a couple of times now is that feathers are in the integument, they're in the skin, and they don't grow into the bone, but very large feathers have an effect on the growth of the bone itself. The bone will respond to the stress of having a large feather that needs a lot of muscle support to help control the flight by growing into a little mound and a little bump. And that gives more surface area for the muscles and the tendons to attach to help with that big feather. And so there's one bump for each of the major feathers going down the ulna of the turkey vulture. And it looks like Velociraptors got the same type of raised bumps. We call these ulnar, uh, ulnar papillae. They're more easily called quill knobs. And they're known from a couple of other dinosaurs, Velociraptor, along with uh, a close cousin called Dakota Raptor, and also a really interesting animal called Concavenator. It has some wild things going on with its spine that had like this really almost like shark, um, shark fin <laughs> like going up on its, on its backbone. Crazy animal. And uh, it's been illustrated with like these spines coming off. They didn't want to put on feathers because nobody had figured that that type of animal would have feathers. But now I'd say fair game, probably did have very large feathers or very large sharp quills, kind of like the cassowary, the modern cassowary does. So here we've got a couple of interesting things. Uh, amongst the other Manoraptorans, the, the raptor group, we have Zenuom, uh, it's a dromaeosaur, so it's in the, the uh, group with Velociraptor itself, and uh, preserved from the lower Cretaceous of China, huge big wing sets with uh, preserved wing feathers, uh, a nice fan on its tail. Its tail is a little short compared to everybody else in its family um, and also some stuff around its head. So, I mean, these images are from fossils that are exquisitely preserved, just absolutely stunningly preserved. And the impressions of the, of the feathers are, um, are quite stunning. I mentioned uh, somebody had asked like, you know, well, what are the dinosaurs that are flying? And uh, so Microraptor can glide from one place to another. Um, some of these other ones might be able to glide, but here we have a group that actually could fly. These are animals called Scansoriopterygids, which is a crazy name. Um, <laughs> basically means the running wing animals. And that's because they look like a bat. Their, their fingers are really long, and in between their fingers is a skin flap just like bats do. But it's not a bat, 
It's not a mammal, it's a dinosaur. And not only does it have skin flaps, it's got feathers on its body as well. So bats have skin flaps and fur. These animals have skin flaps and feathers, major feathers coming off of the tail, these huge long uh, ones, four of them in each of the, uh, the three types that we know. There's uh, two species of um, uh, three, uh, sorry, three genera. We have Epidendrix, Yiki, and Scansoriopterichus. Um, and they're all pretty small. So you can see the, um, the scale there. Take a look at, oops, I guess I didn't have a, a picture of this, but again, membranous wings followed by feathers on the wings around the face uh, and then coming off of the legs. And their, their faces are kind of short um, and, and kind of crazy looking. They're, they're really bizarre. Um, <laughs> it's the sort of thing like I had no idea that God had this kind of this kind of um, curious design in mind because it's 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 like the platypus of the dinosaur kind. These things are really really wild, uh, but definitely flying and, and capable of flight. So um, there's a few others out there. That, I mean, there's plenty of others. There's about 50 different dinosaurs that we know that have feathers. Those are the ones that I've taken a look at from the theropod side of things, from typically the meat eating dinosaurs, aside from the panda group, right? Ornithischians, these are from a whole different set of dinosaurs that are not supposed to be on the line of evolution. So finding feathers in this one, in these groups, was really unexpected uh, from an evolutionary perspective. Calindrodromius is perhaps uh, one of the best. This animal was found in Russia, uh, out in Siberia, and it was, uh, it has both scales and feathery, fuzzy stuff on it. It's got scales around its feet. Um, and there's really beautiful, good skin impressions uh, for this animal. But then it's got fuzz around the upper leg bone area, uh, around the, the lower, uh, the, the shin thigh bone, along with the femur. And it's got some fuzz around its tail and up around its head, but also had scales going down uh, the, the latter part of its tail. So here's a really good example of an animal that has both on one body. And uh, here's a couple of examples. Uh, on the upper part, you can see those scales and, and they look like, you know, nice kind of bricks, you know, stacked one right next to one another. But then on the units below are the kind of fuzz and fibers and fluffy stuff. This is a, a fuzzy dinosaur, um, really fuzzy and not very large. If I go back, um, Looks like I don't have a scale bar uh, for the whole animal, but the whole animal is only a couple of feet long, um, not very large at all. And it's a herbivorous dinosaur um, in the center block labeled C. Uh, that's the uh, skull there. And if you look at the teeth in that area, these are teeth that are all well designed for shredding vegetation. Um, they, the teeth look kind of like leaves almost, and they, they just kind of grind away at vegetation. They're not good for eating meat. So this is definitely not a meat-eating dinosaur. Its hip structure is like the, um, the other Ornithischian groups and things like that. Also in this, um, in this group, um, in, a, in a similar group called the Heterodontosaurs, is uh, another dinosaur from China called Tianyuang. And Tianyuang is uh, very easily identified as a heterodontosaur by the lower right image that you can see there, where there's this big canine tooth that's going from the lower jaw up into uh, the snout. And there's kind of like this semicircle. That is a very characteristic structure in this family of dinosaurs. They've got this wild, you know, almost tusk coming up from the bottom and this notch in the upper jaw that it sits into. And then uh, it's got um, small, uh, kind of a beak out in front. And then the teeth behind are those leaf shaped sort of teeth for, uh, for slicing up vegetation. Uh, in the upper image, you can see the skull on the upper right, a little bit of the arm next to it, and then um, some of the feet, the legs and feet are what are going down there. And near the, uh, the upper left is where you can see a whole lot of the fuzz and fluff, and also around uh, underneath the chin is a bunch of it as well. So another animal with fuzzy stuff all over the place. It looks like hair or fibers. Here's a close-up of some of this. Uh, some of these are quite long. They extend a good distance away from the uh, body. So again, it's not like the stuff underneath your skin that helps hold your skin in place. It's not the collagen that's frayed out. 
um, the image on the lower right that has a little bit of red in it, you can see kind of like, you know, it's black, red, black. What that is, is um, the color pattern on this is that the fibers are dark at the edges and they're lighter in the middle. And what that means actually is um, if you took, say, a straw, like a drinking straw from, uh, you know, a fast food thing, it's hollow in the center and feathers are hollow in their center. If you took that straw and you squashed it down, you would find that it's actually darker around the edges because there's more, um, there's more plastic that gets compacted into the same spot uh, than if you're in the middle. So the edges kind of crush down and form a dense spot on the edges. And then the middle is lighter colored because that was the hollow area. So this was one of the first um, physical evidences for the hollow nature and structure of these materials. And again, this is in the group that's not supposed to be on like bird evolution side of things. So these animals definitely have a hollow fiber and hair like ours, is not a hollow fiber it's a solid fiber so definitely this isn't hair this is feather and this type of material is also seen in a very unexpected place in the dinosaurs this is psittacosaurus psittacosaurus is part of the horned dinosaurs like triceratops the things that have frills and big horns on their faces well there was a discovery of a psittacosaur specimen in mongolia they're well known from that area uh very famous lots of them out there and this one had all these wild and crazy, like nine inch long fibers, hairs protruding out, except they're not hairs, right? Now, with enough evidence of feather everywhere, we can say that these are feather like uh, fibers. And right? these are a lot like the bristles or the um, phylloplume uh, that we see on modern birds. The original description of this back in like 2009 or so. Uh, was very, very careful. They were like, these look like they could be somehow connected to feathers, but we're not going to say that they are because we don't really know. Um, so they were very, very cautious about it in, in a sciencey way of being very cautious. Um, but now that we've got these same types of structures found in other Ornithischian dinosaurs and other ones that are on this group of the duckbills and the uh, horned dinosaurs and the armored things, it seems very apparent now that even the horned dinosaurs might have had feather-like material on their bodies. So, I mean, what this means is that feather-like material is being found all over the place amongst the dinosaurs. And we're going to have to really start rethinking the way that we illustrate and consider what a dinosaur looks like. And one of the reasons I did like uh, the last Jurassic Park movie is that they were willing to go full-on fuzzy. Uh, with things. They, they were very happy to be like, okay, does this thing have feathers? And the scientists were like, yes. Like, great. What kind of feathers? Like fuzz. Or these ones have like full feathers. And so you saw that with one of the raptor dinosaurs that chases Chris Pratt around, right? Um, so that was the, uh, yeah, all, all those different sorts of things. And it's going to be a wild way of reimagining. These aren't the dinosaurs I grew up with. And so for those who are listening, going like, I don't know, Dr. Ross, Dr. McLean, I mean, really, it's not how I remember dinosaurs. It's not how I remember them either. And it's been, it's been part of my own academic journey and, and my own experience as a scientist to see this unfold over the course of, you know, the last few decades and go, wow, uh, it's sometimes really challenging. I, like I said, initially, I didn't think that the evidence for feathers on dinosaurs was very strong. but then the really good evidence started showing up and you know you either you've got a choice right you can either kind of hold on and say no this is the way that i always knew it and and i want to keep it that way or recognize that science is a process of continual discovery and it's okay to look back and revisit what you thought you knew and what we did know for the time based on the best evidence that we had and go well it turns out that picture was incomplete and the picture of dinosaurs has been incomplete since the very beginning, and it's incomplete still now. And we're going to learn more as time goes on. And that's that's exciting. That's really, really fun. So now we've got lots of different types of feathers that are known from dinosaurs. Um, maybe some of these are an artifact of preservation. This was from uh, Matt McLean's paper at the ICC in 2018. The ones that are in red, we're not entirely sure if those are real feather types, but the other ones, we've seen them all on different types of dinosaurs. So it's a lot of different stuff. 
All right, so that closes me out on this part. And so uh, we can take a couple of questions before we uh, before Matt brings us into what creationists have been doing in particular um, about right. feathered dinosaurs and, and research. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Marcus. That was fascinating stuff. So yeah, I've got some questions here. Um, and uh, I think, it, 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 I mean, that last slide that you showed there, I think it's important to note too that all of those feather types uh, they all exist in, uh, you, you find uh, 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 plumaceous feathers and those, uh, the, 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 the very, very, you know, primitive feathers together in the fossil record. I, I'm right about that, right? That it's not yeah. like you find the primitive feather below the panaceous feather. Uh, they, I think, Ceuromimus that you talked about was one of the first ones that had some of these sort of primitive feathers. And yet, Ceuromimus occurs in the fossil record. At about the same time that um, Archaeopteryx does, which has full uh, plumaceous feathers. So yeah. I think it's important uh, just uh, from a creationist perspective to keep that in mind uh, that uh, you have, just because you have all these different uh, 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 sequences in, in a fossil a feather uh, doesn't mean that the primitive ones occurred below the more advanced ones in the fossil record. They actually occur at the same time, which is fascinating from a creationist perspective. Um, okay, so uh, there's some good questions here. So let me uh, put them up on the screen. Okay, here's here's the first one. Uh, had there been any fossils of feathered dinosaurs found outside of China? Yeah, great question, uh, Clive. Uh, yes, so um, I showed a couple of different ones from several different areas. So uh, for example, Sierra Mimus was coming from uh, Germany and uh, we've got, um, uh, we've got um, stuff from uh, Mongolia, uh, so not China proper, but actually from Mongolia, from Russia. Um, there's a really fascinating uh, dinosaur fossil with feathers from Brazil um, that had to be repatriated because it was uh, illegally confiscated from that country. And uh, it kind of threw a monkey wrench into its, um, into its description. I think, uh, Matt, is that one on hold, like until they get it back or something like that? You know, I was just thinking about this the other day. I don't remember actually what yeah. where the current status is on that. Yeah, so it's like they were going to publish on it, then it's like, wait a minute, this was this was kind of stolen. So uh, we got to bring it back. Um, and, and I think the you know the the area paleontologists in Brazil want you know they want to crack at it. So um, so yeah, and, and in fact, uh, we also have uh, feathered dinosaurs from North America, from Canada. Uh, there's a um, an ostrich mimic dinosaur, one of the Struthia mimid uh, groups. And uh, it's got all sorts of fuzz around its legs and stuff like that. That was fascinating, actually, because that one was preserved in a sandstone, hmm. which normally doesn't, you know, preserve fine material. Uh, usually the, the reason why things are found in places like China is, is the same answer for the reason why all the Archaeopteryx are found in Germany. It's like, well, that's because they're there and because the conditions are absolutely perfect for in, in that particular area for preserving this level of of detail and in most mm -hmm. places you don't get that you know you go to the hell creek to find t-rex fossils i mean you know matt knows this better than than any of us here so he works in the lance formation in wyoming and you know you're dealing with sandstones and mudstones and you know you just don't get fine preservation uh, you get good you get good bones you get great bones but you don't get you know those types of uh, you don't get much for skin impressions although you get a few here and there mm. Excellent. Okay, so here's another one. Um, this one is, uh, why is Microraptor not aviali? Uh, I mean, I don't know if it is or not, actually, but uh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So uh, for the for the folks watching this, aviali is going to be the what, what paleontologists mean when they start calling things birds. Okay, we've got aves, which is all the modern birds, but there's birds in the fossil record that are definitely birds. So we need words for them too. So we have other sorts of words going down the net, going down the list. And so aviali is where we kind of say, okay, we, we are in birds now. We are, we're not in dinosaurs. We're, we're in, well, we're not in what most people consider dinosaurs. So <laughs> it gets tricky, right? When you got all these boxes and boxes and boxes and everything's you know subsumed in dinosaurs somehow. But aviali is, is when you get to actual birds. So when you take a look at the skeleton of Microraptor itself, um, you can take a look at, say, the skull. That, that's going to be one of your lead indicators. You've got teeth in there that are recurved, so they're, they're curving backwards. And they've got little serrations on them, just like Velociraptor teeth 
just like uh, Dromaeosaurus and, and the other types, Dakotoraptor, et cetera. Its um, hand structure is not a carpomatocarpus. It's three sizable fingers, you know, and um, they're not fused to one another. They're definitely mobile, able to grasp. Um, you take a look at the tail. Uh, the tail is a long tail, and each of the vertebrae actually have these little prongs that grab onto the next one and hold it so that the tail is fairly rigid. It can flex and move a little bit, but it, it can't like flop everywhere. But it's also not like that little shortened, tiny little nub of bone that you get on modern birds that we call a style. So pygostyle style is like, you know, six or seven vertebrae, maybe as many as nine, and they're all really tiny and fused. Microraptor's got a big long tail that looks like all the other raptors. Mm -hmm. uh, and you look at its feet, it's got, you know, the hook claw, like Velociraptor does as well. So this thing is ticking off all the check marks that you have as, as a raptor, as a dromaeosaurid dinosaur. And that's why when it was first discovered without feather impressions, it was recognized as a dromaeosaurid and put in that category. And then a couple of years later, the feathered ones came out. It's like, oh, wow, turns out Microraptor is plumed and plumed like crazy. So, you know, it's the skeleton that makes the decision on this and skeletally we can identify birds and skeletally we can identify the things that aren't birds and and microraptor is sitting on the not bird side of avl mm, excellent um yeah just with the uh microraptor like you said it's got that uh, carpometacarpus um uh, it doesn't have the carpometacarpus i should say um but you know in some of the and, and of course you know for the folks listening there is some disagreement in creationist circles which is totally fine on uh where we you know what we do with dinosaurs and feathers and i think for the most part the 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 the, the issue sort of comes down to classification which is why dr mclean was talking about that um but i have read some papers they want to call microraptor a bird for example um and uh i find that difficult because it has it doesn't have the carpa metacarpus i mean i mean uh they they they, they will talk about a hoatzin having some little claws but even it has a carpa metacarpus um yeah, you know, Microraptor definitely has those uh, claws, right, on the on the manus. Oh yeah, yeah. and so um, yeah, I mean, what do you think about that? I mean, when we we, we want to call it a bird because it's got feathers, but you know, it's got that that the three clawed hand, which is not the same as you find in you know a, a modern bird. Um, yeah, I, I think that you know, trying to say that something is a bird or not a bird pretty much solely on the basis of feathers, it becomes very problematic. Right. And because the fossil record is not giving us complete animals and all of their integument all the time, right? You, the, we're looking at, at some of the best examples in the history of the world. I mean, these are really spectacular finds. Mm -hmm. um, we've got lots of Velociraptor material and Deinonychus and, and whatnot, and we don't have any feathers on them, but you know, this thing skeletally looks so much like them that we put it in the same family, right? That, that would be like, you know, in, as a modern equivalent, that would be like trying to say that something is really, I don't know, um, really should be considered an otter, even though it's in the dog family. And you're like, well, well wait a minute. You know, you've got all this skeleton that says it's, it's got dog. It's like, yeah, but it's got this one thing that it does with the fat tail. And because it's got this fat tail, we should put it in the otter group because we this thing is it's, it's probably swimming it's a swimming dog and we don't want to have a transition between the dogs and, and the otter group and and i can understand that you don't want to you know i don't think that there was a transition between dinosaurs and birds in kind of that traditional sense but that doesn't mean that we break up members of a family and put them in wildly different spots simply because there's one anatomical unit that it's got that makes us feel uncomfortable. We've, we've got to deal with the whole organism. Mm. And when it comes to Microraptor and, you know, loads of these other things, um, that's what we have. You know, we're able to identify these things to families fairly easily um, once you get the right training. I mean, it's not that it's simple, but, you know, once, once you know what you're looking for, you can do it. And so, no, we don't want to put the dog in with the otters just because it has a fat tail. Yeah. And we don't want to put Microraptor in with the birds simply because it's got feathers. Yeah, excellent. All right, just one more question here, and then I will um, uh, we'll go to the next uh, next um, 
presentation. So here's a question. Uh, thoughts on Proto Avis? Ooh. <laughs> Yikes. All right. Thanks, Caleb, for that one. Uh, Proto Avis is a nightmare of, um, of paleontological history. Um, it was, I can't even call it it because it's, I don't think it's a thing. Um, the discovery was made out in Texas by Sankar Chatterjee and, in Triassic uh, rocks. So, you know, dawn of the dinosaurs type of thing in, in the traditional perspective on this. This is early stuff. This is way before Archaeopteryx, way before any of the raptors or anything like that. Um, and he believed that he found the first bones of a bird. And so he called it Proto Avis. The problem is that Proto Avis was made up of skeletal material from two totally different locations, at least. Um, the notes weren't very good on this, but we knew that the material was coming from different areas. Uh, the material is not well preserved. It, it's really bad and very fragmentary and, and broken. And nobody besides Sankar Chatterjee, I think, has ever believed that it really belonged to a bird. Um, like the people who went out with him, uh, were like, ah, I don't know, but but he he thought he had the thing. And it, it's one of those things in paleontology where like everybody just kind of hopes that it just dies and goes away. And sooner or later, like somebody will look at it and figure out what it actually is and, and save us from this. But until then, nobody's going to pay it any attention because nobody thinks that it's actually a legitimate single fossil. It, it's a it's a variety of different things. And and good luck. Yeah. So we when you got the jumbled remains, they try to make one thing that we call that a chimera, right? Um, like in Greek mythology. And so um, my personal thoughts on Proto Avis, um, you know, everything Marcus said, I totally agree with. But so um, we've been recently learning more and more about animals called drapanosaurs. Um, they're these really unusual um, Triassic reptiles that have um, random features in common with birds. So like their skull will look kind of like a bird and they'll got like sometimes even toothless beaks and stuff. But then the rest of the animal looks like a lizard. I mean, it's got like a, you know, kind of like a grabbing arms for climbing. They got some weird, weird adaptations and stuff like that. Very interesting design on them. Um, but my guess is probably the bird looking stuff in Proto Avis is probably some trypanosaur material then mixed in with some other guests, other, other things is what I would think. Yeah. And, and when, when Chatterjee found this stuff, it was like early eighties um early mid 80s and so drapanosaurs would have been hardly known to anybody um at the time cool that's a good insight thanks matt all right well thank you guys and thanks for the questions uh keep them coming uh we've got one more uh presentation coming up here with um dr mclean so let me uh so matt if you can add your powerpoint and i'm going to remove you uh marcus here and I'll remove myself and I'll put up this presentation. All right, uh, Matt, uh, to take, oh, just before you take it away, just to get another plug for those listening, especially for those that are watching the recording, um, go ahead, hit that like button, subscribe and ring the bell as well. Okay, Matt, she's all yours. Thanks, Ken. Um, so I've got our last topic here for discussion and actually some of the questions that have come up in the, in the comments there and some of the comments as well um, I think we'll actually get addressed in this section, which is, is probably why Ken skipped over some of those. Um, if not, you know, we can address those at the end. But uh, we're looking at the last topic here, topic number four, research results and creation implications. Okay, so what do we do with everything that Marcus and I have just thrown at you, right? And, and this is what Marcus and I have been wondering, right, for the last, you know, however many years, like, what do we do? And we're trying to sift through that and figure it out. And so before we can jump right into, like, how does a creationist think about this? It's helpful for us to kind of review, right? So where are we so far? Okay, so uh, we have really strong evidence for feathers and feather-like structures on many different types of dinosaurs. So Marcus mentioned this in the last talk that there's over 50 different species of dinosaurs recognized that have feather or feather-like integument on them. Uh, and we've got examples from, I listed there, China, Germany, Brazil, Canada, um, Russia, also some other places. Um, and it's very consistent also with the skeletal anatomy and behavioral evidences we have in dinosaurs. So, um, for instance, up in the right corner there, you'll see a skeleton over, over raptorosaur. Um, and so that's uh, one of the dinosaur groups we find feathers on, um, very bizarre dinosaurs with short faces, toothless beaks, often have crests on their heads. Um, and here we've got one sitting on top of a nest of eggs. Um, and those eggs belong to the dinosaur, even though 
um, originally way back when they found the first Oviraptorid. They called it Oviraptor because they thought it was an egg thief because it was near the eggs. Um, but now we found many more fossils where you can actually see the embryos inside and realize, oh, those are Oviraptors for eggs. It was actually protecting the eggs or, you know, I guess it could be stealing its friend's eggs or something. But, um, you know, the idea is that, you know, this animal is sitting on top of a nest of eggs and look at what it's doing with its arms. So you can see the arms and the claws spread out to either side. Um, it's covering up the eggs. Why would it do that? Because it's got feathers, right? If you didn't have feathers, it's a really weird position. But if you've got feathers, it's exactly what birds do is that it's providing, you know, a covering over um, all the eggs there. Um, and I said, it's also consistent with things we learned from skeletal anatomy. So um, this has been known for a long time. I think Mark has mentioned this before that uh, some of our dinosaurs um, non-bird dinosaurs have, um, hollow bones, like some more theropods. Um, but there are, um, not only that, but evidences in both our theropods and our sauropods, um, show that there are, um, evidences for a similar breathing system in these animals as we see in, in birds. Um, so their bones are invaded, um, by the breathing system. It's a pretty crazy setup. They're called pneumatic openings in the bones. You can see some vertebrae there, the yellow ones, are from um, a sauropod, a patasaurus, one of the long-necked dinosaurs, um, a theropod from the family Noosauridae, and a bird, um, you can see there. And they've got lots of openings, um, holes in the bone, and um, open spaces in the bone for the air sacs from the breathing system to invade in there. Um, contrast that with um, our anumatic um, bones up there. So you can see um, a deer and a cow and a, a monitor lizard and an alligator up there, the red ones. Um, they do have some open spaces inside of the bones, but they aren't connected to anything. There's no holes going into there. Um, they're not anything like the way we see um, the birds. And so it would make sense that, you know, yeah, if these guys have some similar systems at play, we would expect other similar systems, right? Um, so they've got feathers, well, they've also got um, this similar breathing system. Um, and it's also consistent for what we know about pterosaurs. So several of you were asking about um, are there other animals that have feathers other than dinosaurs? Um, do we see, you know, things that are similar to dinosaurs with feather-like structures? And um, we've been learning more and more about pterosaurs. Um, and so this is an exciting thing. Um, I'll go back, actually, back to this slide. Um, in the lower right corner there, you can see a silhouette of an anorgnathid. Um, in the anorgnathid, there are different um, filaments um, pointing to different parts of the body where they're finding them. So an anorgnathids are these really tiny pterosaurs um, kind of think of them like little bats. Uh, they're the only pterosaurs that have like, instead of big, long, narrow faces, they got really wide faces, kind of like frogs or like a Muppet um, if they're looking right at you. And um, they're probably insect feeders. And we've known for a long time they have these little bristles on their faces. We've known other pterosaurs have fuzzy covering on them. It's called pycnofibers. Um, they gave that name because we didn't know what they were. i um, not sure what they are. Um, but a paper came out in 2019 where they argued that um, the filaments on these this anorgnathid specimen, uh, actually two different ones, um, that these are actually feathers. Um, and that's because they branch. Um, and so you can see there's different types and different parts of the animal. Um, and a paper responded to it arguing, no, these aren't. In fact, they were trying to argue most of them aren't even integumentary filaments at all. Um, and at least one of those authors was suggesting the idea that all pycnofibers are not pycnofibers, that it's some kind of weird internal thing that's been framed because of decay. Maybe the bristles in the front of an aeronathid are real, but they said the rest of them are an artifact. Um, but the original authors replied, they had good evidence. Um, one of the evidences is that the filaments have um, melanosomes in them, those things that Marcus showed you that, that give color. You don't find that in internal fibers in the body, right? That's something you find in external um, integumentary structures out in the skin. Um, and so they gave a really strong rebuttal for why these are definitely filaments um, that are, are part of the integument um, outside the skin. And they are also um, good evidence, they give good evidence that some of these are branching, there's different types. Um, and what was really exciting was um, just uh, last year, the announcement of a tapajarid pterosaur um, called Tupandactylus imperador. Um, and uh, this is a pterosaur we've known about for a while. We've gotten uh, multiple skulls of it, different body parts and things from Brazil. Um, and we know that it has a big soft tissue crest that you can see there, it kind of looks like a sail. Um, and that's been known for a while as well. That's not a surprise, although it was really cool. Um, but this new fossil was really interesting. It was just the crest, part of the bony part and the soft tissue part. But they did find melanosomes in the crest. They were able to learn some stuff about the color, which is really cool. But they also found some pycnofibers, some of those filaments. And some of the filaments were branching 
and look shockingly similar to feathers. Um, you can see some of those and the images there um, to the point that if you saw this on a bird fossil or dinosaur fossil, you'd be like, yeah, of course that's a feather. But here it is in a non-dinosaur, a non-bird. Um, this is a pterosaur, um, a pterodactyl, right? Um, and um, I talk about the whole issue of feathered pterosaurs in a paper you can read that just came out in the Mathma Journal this year. Um, but we got to start asking this question, okay, how do we think through this, right? Because today we only find feathers in birds. And yet now we're finding animals outside of birds that also seem to possess feathers, right? Um, now, what do we do with this, right? Do we call all these birds? Do we think that, um, you know, some of these things, we redivide, re redetermine that what the term bird means, there's all kinds of things we can do, right? Um, now, of course, we want to be careful here, right? Um, science is a constantly changing thing, just like what you heard from, from Marcus Ross a little bit ago, right? as opposed to scripture, which is firm, um, and what God has said is going to re remain for all time. Science, we're discovering, right? We're learning. We realize we have mistakes. We learn things we didn't know. So I'm saying the pycnophibers and pterosaurs, they look like feathers. Could it be that they're not true feathers? I don't know, right? Maybe some of the things in Ornithischians we found actually aren't true feathers. Um, and there's been some debate about this in the literature. So this is not like a settled thing um, for some of these other animals like Ornithischians and pterosaurs. Um, but they do look very convincing like feathers. And it's consistent with this idea that um, some of these theropods have feathers, right? That these animals have more structures than we were aware of before. And that's really cool um, and very, very exciting. But now we got to get that question. People are wondering, whenever we talk about this, doesn't it, you know, if, if our dinosaurs have feathers, even some pterosaurs, whatever, doesn't that mean that birds evolved from dinosaurs, right? Isn't that the argument? But the answer is no doesn't mean that, okay? Um, acknowledging that two creatures share similarities is not proof for evolution from a shared common ancestor, right? Um, it could be. That's one hypothesis, right? That's a possibility. Um, but that's not automatically the case. Now, I do want to point out, evolutionists did predict the existence of feathered dinosaurs. Um, they said, we will find these things. Um, and then we did, right? Um, and so people hear that, and they're like, wow, that, that sounds like, you know, um, like they're right. Okay. Um, but you know, put on the brakes for a minute. Let's think about this. Um, I think that those predictions could work just as well from a creationist model, right? If we took the question of biological similarity seriously and looked into it and creationists have done this for centuries, um, we might be able to posit particular, you know, what, what kinds of things we might think might exist as well. It's just, we didn't really try, right? We didn't have people actually looking at this. And I think there are some good reasons why we might come up with the idea that there could be feathered dinosaurs um, even before they existed, right? Um, and obviously we're you know, playing this game of, you know, hindsight and everything, but, but I want to point out, it's not just feathers on fossils that makes people think that birds and dinosaurs share similarities, right? Um, so consider for a minute genetics. Okay. So um, when you do genetic studies of vertebrate animals, um, and these have been done for decades now, um, you're doing these phylogenies, consistently what they find is that birds are most similar. So here's our birds right here. What are they most similar to? Look at that guy, alligator mississippiensis, alligators, okay? Um, and then that group is more similar to um, turtles and out to lizards, and then you expand out to mammals, amphibians, and things like that. Um, that's really interesting, right? Um, and so if we looked at that, we might say, huh, the most similar animal genetically to a bird is a reptile, um, and specifically an archosaur reptile, right? And we actually see the same thing. We look at development. This is a, um, a chart that was made by uh, Von Baer, who was this expert in developmental biology way back in the day. In fact, he was the guy um, who really pushed back against this idea that um, embryos go through their evolutionary stages, um, you know, during their development, that like we are a fish and then we're an amphibian, everything as an embryo. Um, he's like, no, 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 that's not the case. Um, and he's writing about this in 1850. Well, it's actually collected in 1853. Um, but you can see here, it almost looks like a cladogram, right? Almost looks like an evolutionary tree right there. Um, and his birds, he says, develop most similarly to reptiles. So if you actually break it down, right? Um, you have animals with gills, animals without gills, right? And when you watch their embryonic development, 
The mammals are all more similar to each other than they are to other things. And the birds and reptiles are more similar to each other than other things. And so if we are paying attention to the patterns we see in comparative anatomy, in fossils, in genetics, in developmental biology, we would say, yeah, birds have similarities with reptiles and specifically archosaur reptiles. And so knowing that if we discover archosaur reptiles that have even more traits in common with birds, right? So for instance, like we talked about um, the hollow bones and the, um, the air sacs that are invading the bones, we might guess, yeah, I wonder if they might've had feathers. And we just did that without being evolutionists. We just sat there and thought through it by thinking about homology and um, all these different pieces of evidence we had as creationists. And we'd say, yeah, no, I could imagine there being some reptiles out there that have feathers. Um, acknowledging that two sh creatures share similarities is not proof for evolution from a common ancestor, right? Sometimes I, I see creationists that are, are so scared of sounding like evolution um, that they'll run completely the opposite direction, right? You get that pendulum swing, right? So they'll say, oh no, monkeys and humans share nothing in common. Well, obviously that's not true. We'll have blood, you have lungs, hearts, you know, DNA. Like we actually have a lot in common, right? Um, obviously we're distinct. We're not in the same created kind. Acknowledging that two things share similarity doesn't automatically prove evolution. And when we act like it does, we're actually giving a win to the evolution side, right? Because what we're saying is biological similarity is proof for evolution. Hey, that's not what we want to say. Creationists need to do some philosophy, right? We need to think through these things. We need to acknowledge what's in front of us and think through it from biblical creationist perspective. And there's many creationists out there trying to do that. And they sometimes disagree and come to different conclusions. And that's okay. That's how science works. But the point is we don't have to be scared and we can genuinely look at things and make hypotheses and predictions and all kinds of fun stuff. So let me show you an interesting example. What is this fossil? Okay, this is BMM 500 called the Solnhofen specimen. It was collected in the 1960s from near Eichstadt, Germany. Okay, um, and so we can ask that question. Who's that Pokemon, right? Um, what is this thing? Okay, it's... Archaeopteryx. Da, 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 da. Okay. Um, when they originally found this, they thought it was a Compsognathus, that it was a, a theropod dinosaur. And it wasn't until Peter Wilmhofer studied this in 1988 that he realized, oh, this is actually a fossil of Archaeopteryx that doesn't have feathers preserved. Okay. Um, and so why did the original collector think that this was a dinosaur? Because when you take the feathers off of an Archaeopteryx, it looks like a dinosaur, right? In fact, this point was made by John Ostrom back in the mid to late 1900s before we were finding the feathered dinosaur fossils from China and stuff. He said that if not for the feathers, it's probable that Archaeopteryx would have been classified as a dinosaur. Oh, and by the way, it's not the only time it's happened. There's actually another specimen of Archaeopteryx called Eichstadt specimen that was also considered a dinosaur first before it was recognized as Archaeopteryx. So now that we see that there's all these things that are similar, there's these links that we can see. Um, once again, the evolutionist is taking those links and making transitional forms out of them, right? They're, they're connecting the dots and they're saying, I see evolution. Well, what do we do as a creationist? How do we do deal with the fact that there are similarities biologically between birds and between dinosaurs? Well, one of the things we can do is what's called baromenology. So I saw somebody in the comments was talking about created kinds, right? Um, this is the study of created kinds. And so different creationists have attempted to apply baromenological methods to look at feathered dinosaurs. So Garner et al., you can see that was an ICC paper back in 2013. They looked at fossil birds, dromaeosaurids, so like Velociraptor and Microraptor and those guys, and the Troodontids. Um, so you remember the conductor on the dinosaur train who was a Troodon, okay? Um, they want to figure out what do we see here? And they found evidence for discontinuity between birds and dinosaurs, okay? Um, and then in 2018, um, I worked with some other colleagues, Matthew Spites and Matt Patron. We looked at um, whole bunch of different types of feathered dinosaurs. Okay, so if we put this chart up here um, and you can see these different recognizable groups of dinosaurs that um, we found feathers on. Um, so, uh, and then at the bottom there you have birds. Um, so we looked at each one of these. Um, we did several different analyses. And what we found was each time you recognize a group, guess what? it looks like a created kind, right? There's a reason that we recognize there are dinosaurs, different from one of the mimosaurs, different from, you know, um, dromaeosaurids or things like that. Yeah, because these are distinct, discrete, created kinds. There's different 
species within different varieties within the created kinds, but the created kinds look like they have pretty good boundaries. Okay. Um, and so we found in a few cases, like with Trodonts and Dromaeosaurids, these might be in the same created kind, um, but you know, they might not be. Okay. And that's for further work to try and figure that out. Um, but that's really cool. We found discontinuity between these different types of feathered dinosaurs, as well as discontinuity between birds and these different feathered dinosaur groups. And that's really exciting because that means the story of a general unbroken continuum from a small meeting dinosaur to a modern bird, that's a myth. That's, that's a, that's a story you can put on the data. It's one way to interpret it. But as we're looking at other data, we're realizing that's not a, the best story here. The series is punctuated by discontinuity, which is exactly what creationists would predict. However, there have been some creationists who disagree with some of our results um, and our reasoning. So I'm um, sure Hadi et al. 2020, I mentioned there, published in Journal of Creation. Um, they did some new analyses where they challenged the idea that Archaeopteryx um, might be continuous with dromaeosaurids, which is one of the things we presented in our paper. Um, Haynes 2022 and Answers Research Journal argued that Archaeopteryx has nothing in common with dinosaurs and is obviously a bird. Um, and those are those are direct quotes from there. Um, you know, uh, Marcus and I are actually writing a response. We did write a response. It's going to be published very soon, probably this month. Um, we'll see. In Answers Research Journal, um, responding to, to um, Dr. Haynes's paper. Um, and so this is an active area of creationist discussion and research, and that's good. It's, it's okay for us to have different opinions as, as creation scientists. Um, that's how science works, right? We learn from each other and realize, oops, I was wrong or you were wrong. And we learn new things as we go along. And, and that's exactly how science should work. So now that we looked at the science side of things, let's start thinking about the scriptural side of things, right? Um, are feathered dinosaurs inconsistent with the Bible, right? Um, well, I would suggest to you, no. Now, some people say, well, hold on. What about the days of creation, right? Because birds are made on the fifth day of creation, agreed. Whereas land animals like dinosaurs, right? So you think about something like I've got a Coelophysis here, or you think about like a T-Rex or something, you would think that's that's a day six animal, right? That's that's something that was created as a land animal. Um, and that kind of seems like, okay, well, then how can you say that there's, you know, feathered dinosaurs? Well, I don't think that this logically really follows, right? Because um, let's say, what day were mammals made on? Okay, we might be tempted to think, well, yeah, day six, right? We've got our wombats, our red pandas here, okay? Um, these are land animals. But hold on a minute. Um, there are also flying mammals, right? There's bats. And in fact, when you read Leviticus, a bat is listed as a type of bird, right? So I think in Hebrew thinking, this is probably a day five animal. Um, so here we have a category of animals, taxonomic category, where some are made on one day and some are made on another day. So... I don't have a problem with some dinosaurs being made on day six and some being made on day five or some feathered things being made on day five and some on day six, right? Just like there's some furry things on day five and some furry things on day six. Um, and in fact, the Hebrew word that's used um, in Genesis one isn't bird. It's that winged category, the winged flying thing. So bats fit into that category um, in Leviticus. Um, and so I don't think we need to worry too much about this. We're confusing modern taxonomy with how Hebrew people were talking about animals. Um, you know, the Bible is not presenting for us a taxonomic scheme, right? Um, a scientific taxonomic scheme for us to use. It's just telling us what day God made things and he can make them however he wants to make them. And he told us how he made them. He made flying things and swimming things on one day and land things on the other. Um, and so those are general categories and we can kind of sit there and think through what they mean, but they're in no way controlling how we classify things today. Now, um, major creation organizations, um, for the most part, concur there are feathers on many of these fossils. There's, there's some debate. Some people might not accept the things like on Scurimimus we saw or Sinosauropteryx as fossils. But Microraptor, pretty much everyone's in agreement. That's a, that's a feathered fossil. Um, and so some of the creation organizations, what their, their kind of response to this has been um, to call the, what we would call dinosaur fossils with feathers on them, they'd call those birds. Um, whereas the other dinosaurs, they would call dinosaurs, right? So here we got Microraptor on the right, Deinonychus on the left. Microraptor in their scheme would be a bird, whereas Deinonychus would be a dinosaur in the other scheme. And Marcus already addressed this, so I, I don't need to go into great detail here. But, um, you know, essentially, we find this problematic because you're taking two animals that are in the same family and you're separating them out. And you're like, well, this one should be in this taxonomic group and this one should be in that taxonomic group just because of feathers. 
But when we didn't find feathers in Microraptor, it fit all the check marks, right? Go down the list. It's a dromaeosaurid. It's clearly a dromaeosaurid. Um, so it'd be better to say, if you wanted to, all dromaeosaurids are birds. Um, that might be a better division to make. And, you know, the term bird is not a, um, you know, a Linnaean taxonomic term, right? You know, it's not aves or aviale or something. It's a, it's a general colloquial term, bird, right? And so we can debate about what exactly is a bird. Do you want to draw the line there or draw the line there? But that's just a semantics question, right? Um, the truth is, when you look at the comparative anatomy, actually look at the animal, Microraptor is clearly the same kind of basic creature as something like a Deinonychus. Um, and, you know, anybody who's doing detailed work on this is, is going to agree that, yeah, there's a ton of skeletal similarities here that would link these two things. So as we're thinking through this topic, um, what I want to suggest to you is that uh, the reason we struggle with this a lot is because we come to the table with lots of assumptions. And we all do this, right? This is that whole question of worldview and paradigm and all those kinds of things. And I think um, sometimes as creationists, we, you know, we talk a lot about worldview and about assumptions and stuff, and we're really quick to like point it out on the other side and not to look at ourselves, right? Uh, we come with assumptions. Uh, we come with baggage. We look at the world today and there's these very discrete groups, right? There's mammals and there's birds and there's reptiles, and there's fish and there's amphibians. You see these different colored circles or colored ellipses there. Um, and we don't see things that are kind of like a bird and kind of like a reptile, right? Or kind of like a mammal and kind of like a reptile. But the fossil record does have things like that. And so an evolutionist looks at this and they make a tree, right? They're like, oh, I see fish going to amphibians and then reptiles and then splitting up. Yeah, that's one way you could interpret it, right? But that's inconsistent with scripture. Um, and it's not the only way to interpret it. Um, in fact, when we look at it zoomed out like this, yeah, we can see all these connections and think of it as a spectrum. But when you zoom in, you can see discrete units. Right? We're seeing more in terms of how God chose to design things, the bigger blueprints that he used, um, than we are seeing any kind of like a, you know, a, co a continuity of life in terms of evolution. Right, um, The scriptures are very clear that God created different kinds of animals during the creation week. Um, and I think that is what we see when you actually do the bare monology. You see discrete kinds of feathered dinosaurs, um, which is what you'd predict as a creationist, not what you'd predict as evolutionist. Um, and so if you want to learn more about this, um, you can also check out um, my 2020 paper with E Origins, um, where, you know, this figures in there and, and lots of other fun discussion about feathered dinosaurs. Um, but I just want to conclude with that comment that um, all of this kind of work really challenges our assumptions and it, and it kind of flies in the face of what we expect. But that's always what science has done, whether it's combining electromagnetism or looking at quantum mechanics or relativity or um, you know, how we think things work inside our bodies, right? There's all kinds of surprises. Every generation comes up with new scientific surprises, things we didn't know. And at first we're very hesitant. We're like, oh, I don't know what to do with that. But then we realize, hey, we're looking at something new here. This is exciting. This is what God made. And it's not incompatible with the Bible at all. It's a really, really cool, exciting thing. Okay, thank you, uh, Matt. Let me just put you all back up here. Okay, if there are any other questions, uh, then go ahead and stick them in. I've got a couple here. Uh, so here is one. Um, and I think we already sort of talked about this, but go ahead and uh, whatever you guys want to have to say about that. I mean, yeah, I think a lot of these feathered dinosaur fossils are construed by evolutionists as being transitional forms. Um, but they're bringing that paradigm with them to look at the fossil record, right? They're expecting to see transitional forms. Um, and this is where I think um, Kurt Wise's terminology is really helpful. Um, we talk about there are, as creationists, we say there are animals that are morphological intermediates, right? So that'd be like something like Archaeopteryx, where we'd say, yeah, it's got some traits of reptiles and some traits of birds. Um, but just because something is a morphological intermediate doesn't mean that it's actually something evolving into something else, right? Um, God made a plethora of living things, right? Um, and he used design patterns that we can see, um, especially when I mentioned development, right? Every animal has got to grow from a single cell, right? So there's got to be similarities between creatures. That's, that's not shocking. We would expect to see, you know, different spectra that we could draw, right? Um, and animals falling along those lines. Um, but I don't think what we see is, and this is what I was pointing out with terminology earlier. I don't think we see an actual um, unbroken continuum from something like, you know, an unfeathered theropod all the way to, you know, a crow, right? It is actually punctuated by 
um, lots of examples of discontinuity, discrete created kinds. Mm. Excellent. Now, here's another one. Now, again, I think you've sort of addressed this, but um, maybe you can have a quick look at that. Um, yeah, so other dinosaur resembling creatures that show evidence of feathers, um, I think that's our pterosaurs. Um, and, and my personal guess is um, that these uh, pycnofibers we see on pterosaurs are probably homologous with feathers. They're probably the same kind of structure um, developmentally and um, anatomically and, and I think even chemically. My main holdup actually for a while on whether or not these we should call these things feathers uh, was the alpha keratin beta keratin issue because when they started testing these pterosaur feathers or pterosaur pycnofibers with um, you know looking at the chemistry of them they were coming up as alpha keratin and they're like well, that's really weird because um, that's what we wouldn't expect to find that in feathers and I'm fine with the idea that they're something else entirely I think that'd be cool right um, but now that they're doing this new research showing that it turns out under certain conditions beta keratin actually will fall apart and become alpha keratin and that makes more sense than of what you're seeing with those pterosaur fossils mm, excellent yeah look i mean um th that was fascinating what you had to say about uh the continuity issue um i and i think that's really really important uh from a creationist perspective because we've traditionally as creationists had this um concept in our mind uh, of great levels of discontinuity between different organisms. And what we're starting to see is when we look at the fossil record is that there are there's much more continuity than we once thought was the case. Um, but as you said, um, first of all, uh, back you know back in the uh, 19th century, 18th, 19th century, a lot of Christians were actually already thinking in those terms. In fact, uh, they would have been thinking a lot more in terms of continuity than we do today. Uh, so it's kind of interesting how we, uh, those ideas sort of went away. And um, I guess most creationists don't know um, that in scientific history, that was actually quite, it was actually quite common for scientists to talk in terms of continuity because that's the way they thought God had designed things <laughs> in this continuity uh, uh, with, a, with a spectrum of continuity. Uh, so it's kind of interesting how that those ideas just sort of got suppressed or they went away and uh, modern creationism began to think in terms of great levels of discontinuity. And so now when we see continuity in the fossil record, there tends to be dissonance with modern creationists, I guess, because of, I mean, what do you think, um, Matt, Marcus, because of, I guess, how we've been conditioned? as creationists what do you think about that yeah i mean I, I think i think you're right ken like i think there's a natural tendency um to think in terms of discontinuity because we don't we want to stay far away from evolution right we don't want to sound like evolution and and i get that i mean it's the same thing with with any theological issue right um when you're when you're in a um a baptist church that doesn't want to sound charismatic you know <laughs> like, like put keep your hands down you know like and and, and the thing is um you know, I think we have to find that that direction of, OK, we want to represent what's real. We want to understand what's actually out there. Um, you know, uh, either what does the Bible say? What do what do the rocks show us? What are the fossils that are there? Um, you know, what are the living things? All that kind of stuff. Um, and it makes sense. There has to be both discontinuity and continuity. Right. Um, there has to be discontinuity because otherwise we couldn't tell things apart. Right. And we can't. We right. clearly can. Right. <laughs> That's what we do and all the time, not even a scientist, right? Like I recognize which human being is my wife and my children, right? As opposed to other human beings. Um, but there's also continuity. The fact that I recognize all my children as human most of the time, right? Um, like I can, I can look at my, you know, other human beings around me and I say, that's a human, right? Um, there's continuity there. And so um, we have to obviously think in terms of, of both. And I, I think it's tempting to just want to go fully one way or the other because it's comfortable, right? Anytime yeah. we have to get in that, that gray area, things always get, get more challenging. Yeah. You, you gave a really good example there as well, just with human development, uh, that, uh, you know, we see humans developing from a zygote and uh, they go through infinite numbers of iterations to become a baby. And then they go through infinite numbers of iterations again to become uh, an adult and eventually, you know, a, a fully mature adult and an old person. And so, uh, it's interesting that uh, you can pick any of those different uh, points in that developmental scheme. And uh, the morphology is very different 
from another time, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, a zygote is very different from a fetus and a fetus is very different to a three-year-old baby and a three-year-old baby is very different to a grown adult. So here you have these very different morphological shapes all together uh, in a continuous developmental series that God created and ordained. And so there we see continuity in developmentalism, uh, which is obviously God's blueprint. So I think that's really interesting. And can we, what do you think? Can, I mean, can we use something like that as an analogy for life in general? People have tried to do that throughout the history of science. Um, <laughs> you see that coming up again and again. There's a really cool paper. I suggest people check it out if you're interested in this topic at all. Um, it's by Kurt Wise. It's published in Journal Creation, Theology, and Science. And the paper is called um, Ontogeny as a Diversification Analog. Um, and the whole paper kind of has that kind of language. Um, but I think if you read it and read it and read it again, he's got some really interesting ideas there um, about um, links between the way we watch you know, creatures develop from, you know, an embryo um, and how we think about um, the created kinds diversifying within their, in their boundaries. Um, but obviously there, there are differences, right? Because um, with, with, you know, ontology, with growth and development, right? It truly is a spectrum. Like there's no point where you can like, yeah, you can say this is the two month mark and this is the two year mark and things, but like, it's not like you're watching your kid and you wake up the next morning. You're like, oh, wow. Yeah, that's a transition, right? Like it, it's that slow gradual thing. And suddenly you're like, oh, wait a minute. I missed it. Like when, when did they do right. that? Um, and I think that's very different ultimately from what we see when we look um, at, at the full, um, that's what I'm looking for, spectrum of life, right? That, yeah. yes, I can think of a spectrum in terms of all the animals from worms to, you know, amphibians to mammals and that kind of stuff. But I can also go in and say, like, you know what? Aardvarks, very distinct. Like, this is a clear group. Um, there's just nothing else like this kind of thing. Um, and even when we throw in the fossil animals, like, we're still seeing those clear boundaries. Sometimes the boundaries are harder to see. Sometimes um, we may redefine the boundaries as we find new things. But those boundaries are there. Yeah, good. Yes. Yeah, so so uh, continuity, uh, something that we've discussed a lot of. But discontinuity is also important. Uh, and we know that's important because, uh, you know, God says he created uh, kinds, which seems mm -hmm. to indicate discontinuity. Uh, and uh, he also brought those kinds to Adam to name. And if there was uh, some, you know, infinite number of iterations between a dog and a cat, well, that's going to be a bit hard for poor old Adam. Uh, so obviously there was discontinuity uh, with the mm -hmm. animals that God brought, that God created. But at the same time, continuity and so uh, just some interesting perspectives that i think we need to be thinking of. And I'll, I'll pop some links down in the description as well for some videos that i've made on that for uh, those who are watching later okay i do have a question here uh, that i'll pop up um so do you think we need to expand our arguments about discontinuity to take into account the depositional environment at the place and time where supposed tradition uh, transition should be found He's got it at me, but I'm guessing it's it's all three of us can go. No, ahead. you you have to answer this, Ken. Your name's right out there on it. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, <laughs> I would say absolutely. Uh, we do right because um, continuity. I don't think continuity in and of itself is uh, uh, like a piece of evidence number one in favor of evolution, um, and, and neither should it be evidence in form of you know piece of evidence number one in in favor of creationism i mean continuity is just it's just what it is it's continuity but if you find continuity in the fossil record that's another area that's certainly going to uh support an evolutionary paradigm and so i think it is important then for us to be looking in terms of continuity and how that fits in with the fossil record um so for example uh you do see continuity uh, in fossil forms of, of horses. So you've got Mesohippus, um, you know, and, and we could go right back to Heracotherium if, if we wanted to. Um, but I certainly know that certainly from most conservative creationist perspectives like Anson Genesis, except Mesohippus uh, in the Equus family. Um, and so we do see continuity in the fossil record. Um, and so that would certainly uh, support, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't call it, you know, evolution. I'm going to call it diversification because 
I think that's a better term for creationists to use. Um, so you can see uh, that continuity working biologically. Um, but um, there are other times in the fossil record. So, for example, and I've done some videos in this, and again, I'll put some links there. Uh, you know, you do find, uh, you know, so-called continuous fossil sequences out of sequence. They don't appear where they should. Uh, and so, for example, you see a lot of these, you know, we're talking theropods, you see a lot of these so-called um, more uh, primitive forms appearing well above the more advanced forms with fully plumaceous feathers. Uh, and so that you do see things like that in the fossil record where they do seem to be, that's not where you would expect to put them. Now, that doesn't mean uh, it's, an, it's a no-brainer against an evolutionary perspective because it, it might just mean the fossils haven't been found. But um, it certainly fits with a, a creationist perspective. So that's what I've got to say. What about you guys? Yeah, uh, Matt had mentioned uh, Kurt Wise before uh, on uh, morphological intermediates, and he also uh, coined a term in the past of stratomorphic intermediates. So that's when you've got your morphological intermediates that are also in proper stratigraphic sequence. Yeah. And, you know, how many times does that actually happen? And in some things, it does it rather well. You mentioned Ken the horses, you could throw in rhinos and camels and, you know, a, a bunch of the other, uh, you know, Eocene to present mammals. And uh, for a good number of us in creationism, that's part of part of what we think is, you know, going on after the flood. Uh, for those of us who think that the flood boundary is, you know, somewhere, you know, in the Eocene or south of that, you know, say KPG or, or what have you. Um, but a lot of us who look then at some of these mammal sequences and, and what seems to be happening to them and recognize, okay, it seems like we've got the same family, super family, family suborder, whatever Linnaean system <laughs> ends up being. But you see that in Mesohippus, you see Myohippus, you see Pliohippus, you see Merikippus, right? And you're like, you know, these, these really look all like horses. And it's kind of going from, you know, mediums to small size, three toes on up to this. And yeah, there's branching and whatnot, but I can follow this line. Mm -hmm. And and that seems to me to be a good evidence for um, you know, the diversification within a kind. Uh, our evolutionary colleagues think that that's a good example of macroevolution. Um, you know, and depending on how one defines macroevolution, even I could say, yeah, you know, if you're gonna say it's above the species level, well then yes, uh, it is, because we're looking at genera and, and whatnot. Uh, but as you mentioned, Ken, you know, the um, the dinosaur stuff. Not so much, you know, I followed uh, in my presentation, I followed kind of the cladistic um, layout of those dinosaurs. And what that ends up doing is I think giving um, a, a, not a skewed perspective, but a particular perspective mm -hmm. on the development, because you tend to see a bunch of the fuzzy things first. And then as you get into the, the deeper areas of Manoraptora with you know, the Dromaeosaurids and the Troodontids and whatnot, then it's like, wow, everything's like, fully plumed but as you mentioned you know you got you've got archaeopteryx and you know some of your truodontids and things like that are, are very similar to these sorts of things they've all got feathers at a time you know according to an evolutionary perspective or at least an old age perspective you know we don't have therizinosaur yet <laughs> and those yeah. those hairy pandas are not wandering around yet <laughs> and yet we've got <laughs> Fully, fully plumed dinosaurs and avialans and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I were to redo this presentation, one of the things that I might do is go, okay, well, let's look at it as stratigraphic set mm -hmm. and, and track these things all out. And it's like, wow, you know, all right, so I've got the squirrel mimic and I've got Archaeopteryx and they're together and it looks like an ecosystem, right? It, it doesn't look like an evolutionary sequence. It looks like an ecosystem. Yeah. Um, an example I would give to my students about trying to get their minds around that you can get what seems to be an evolutionary sequence through simple ecosystem destruction would be, okay, let's just say that there was like this massive flood that, you know, came down out of the mountains and of uh, Washington State and out into Puget Sound. And along the way, it wiped out your rivers and, you know, your estuary and into your oceanic communities. And you would be able to find things like weasels and um and river otters that were buried potentially in some kind of sequence around with you know harbor otters and seals right or something like that and you could put together a very convincing argument of a 
you know, depending on how they got buried, of a terrestrial incursion by a secondarily uh, aquatic mammal group, and that they became terrestrial again. Or you bury them in the opposite direction, and this is going to show you how these weasels eventually became seals, right, or sea lions or what have you. And you could make a pretty good argument out of this, and yet you're looking at, you know, five or six different species that are alive all at the same time and simply living in different places. Mm. So those the, to get to the question that Paleologos was asking here, right? Yes, depositional environments and the time and the place in which transitions should be found is tremendously important. And what we see with things like this topic, or if we were talking about the whale fossils, or especially the earliest whale fossils, we find a bunch of those that are supposed to be in stratomorphic sequence in the same rock units or in equivalent rock units just on the other side of a mountain. And you're like, well, okay, so we've got the walking whales and the swimming whales pretty much together or, you know, within like two million years. That's not enough time mm -hmm. for evolution to produce these things. It looks like we've just got animals that are part of a big unit, big family of some kind, and they're in different ecologies and they're being buried. And in the post-flood period where I think those fossils are, are showing up, you know, if that's, if that is winding down catastrophe, then we have ample opportunity for lots of catastrophes to bury those those animals in those ecosystems. And we can mistake the ecology for a evolutionary sequence. Yeah, excellent. Matt, have anything else to add? Nope, all good? Nope. Okay, well, I think maybe we should wrap it up here. We've been going for over two hours. Um, so we'll give everyone a rest. Um, I just, I mean, I guess the last thing that I want to say is um, just going back to, I mean, I think, I think, and I don't know if you guys would agree with me, just regarding uh, feathered dinosaurs and how creationists are interpreting it because of the, the, the dissonance that's going on in the community. I, am I wrong? Is the biggest thing here, is it come down to classification? Because it seems to me from, I, I just did some background reading for this discussion looking at some of these uh, Haynes articles and other articles. And it seems to me that everyone is in agreement, for example, for the most part, that Microraptor had feathers. Mm -hmm. And uh, But what I was getting from those papers was, it's because it had feathers, I'm going to call it a bird. Yeah. Um, that seemed to be the takeaway. So... I guess, uh, I mean, I have heard creationists out there. I, I watch occasionally some of these, uh, you know, online uh, social media platforms, Young Earth creationist ones, and creationists will say something like they're they're familiar with just a little bit of this conversation going on within creationism, and they'll say something like, uh, dinosaurs didn't have feathers. And so um, my caution would be to those creationists out there that, that maybe side with uh, the other creationist position, which is totally fine, is maybe not, well, definitely don't say that because that gives people the wrong impression. I would say something more like Microraptor's a bird. If you're going to say something and that's what you're going to say, then at least say that because then it doesn't sound like you're basically denying a whole bunch of fossil evidence. So I, I think it's good this discussion for us to kind of get an idea for you know what what's going you know all about feathered dinosaurs and um you know what are the kind of the fundamental issues here and it does seem to be down to taxonomy um you know just, if it has feathers are we going to call it a bird and i think we've already discussed no we wouldn't do that uh when we found the earliest microraptors the people uh, the creationists who perhaps don't agree with with us and others would have called that a dinosaur does that mean when they found it with feathers, now it's a bird? And I think hopefully that's a great take home point. If that's what we're going to do, then we, I, I don't think we can do that. That that's that obviously there's an issue there. So um, any final thoughts guys before we close this out? I think, um, cause going off what you're saying, Ken, you know, why, why not just say, you know, my craft is a bird instead of dinosaurs with no feathers. Um, because people don't ask the question whether Microraptor is a bird, right? They ask the question whether dinosaurs have feathers. And and I think that's, it comes to an unapologetic thing, right? Um, and I think this is the challenging part where you have um, science and research meets like the public communication side of things and the apologetic side of things. And so um, 
And when Marcus and I have talked to a lot of people, a lot of different creationists about this topic, I may, Marcus, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the number one concern I hear from people is if we tell people that dinosaurs have feathers, they're going to get confused and think that we're saying that dinosaurs evolved in birds. Um, and that's, that's typically what I hear. And, you know, Marcus had a really good comment at the ICC. Um, and, uh, you know, he said like, um, I, I'm going to butcher this. You did it better than me, but, you know, essentially it was like, you know, we always talk about, um, you know, putting the cookies down on the lower shelf so that people can get them. Right. Um, but we need to start thinking in terms of giving a person a step stool and teaching them how to use it, you know? And I think this is the, this is one of those opportunities where, you know, yeah, yeah I'm not, I feel no need for the average person to have a great understanding of cladistics. I just, I don't. Um, I think even if I were an evolutionist, I would still just be like, you know, Hey, go, go get your groceries, do your thing. But when it, when it actually intersects with what, what people care about, what they're interested in, you know, we don't want to be people who shy away from saying, you know, calling a spade a spade, right. A thing is a thing. Um, and I think we just, we want to be really careful that we're not making apologetics arguments that are based off of our current, you know, assumptions and thinking that aren't going to hold up. Um, and obviously we can't know the future. We don't know how things work out, but as we're starting to see these things, I would just say, you know, can you talk about what, what should a person say and said, I would say, you know, birds did not evolve from dinosaurs, right? Go back to the basic idea of flying animals are created on a different day than land animals. Like yeah. that, that defeats that whole thing right there from a scriptural argument. Right. Um, and that avoids this whole discussion of can there be feathered dinosaurs, right? Um, and I, you know, I think I've heard some other creationists who aren't paleontologists and have tried to talk about this, you know, who have just said, if God wants to put feathers on a dinosaur, he can put them on there. Like it, it's fun, you know, and, and I think that's that's how I would encourage people who are talking about this in apologetic scheme of things, you know, to say, like, look, just because two things share something in common doesn't automatically mean that they share a common ancestor. Um, and that's that's kind of the direction I would take it. Great. All right. Well, look, thank you guys. Uh, is, is Marcus going to say anything? Do you want to say anything? <laughs> yeah, Marcus. I don't know. You, you had my, uh, you had my line from ICC. So that, you know, it was pretty good. And um, you. yeah, no problem. But <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I resonate with a lot of the same thing. You know, we're, we travel in a lot of the same circles. We talk to a lot of the same folks, but also when we're talking to the folks, you know, at church, and, and my wife's trying to tell them like, Hey, there's been this big controversy or, or what have you. And they, they look at her like, why? You know, yeah. <laughs> and they said, like, so like, couldn't God, like, like you just said, now, like, they're like, so couldn't God just put feathers on a dinosaur? And I'm like, okay, good. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that's all right. Yeah. And, and it's all right for dinosaurs to have more things in common with birds than lots of other things, including feathers. You know, as Matt said, we've got plenty of genetic evidence that birds are far more similar to certain types of reptiles than they are to other types of things. Yeah. So given that we already knew from anatomy long ago that dinosaurs were most similar to birds and crocodilians, then it's not surprising that there are going to be a bunch of other things that show up along the way yeah. that show their similarities. And, you know, so somebody asked me on, on Facebook, um, I think last night or so, um, you know, why, why talk about this? You know, what's, why would you go on YouTube and talk about dinosaurs and birds? Like, what's the point? And I would say the, the point is, uh, I remember a great line from Paul Nelson in the movie Expelled that came back back in, came out back in 2007. And he said, to discover something true has a value of its own. Mm -hmm. And if it has any additional benefits, so much the better. So, you know, the reason that we love doing science stuff, right? The reason why we get a hammer and hit a rock and hope that we find something fun right, is, is not because we think it's going to make us rich or anything like that. It's not. <laughs> Neither, none of us here have, have apparently <laughs> hit that mother. Right? But we do it because there's an opportunity to discover something that God hid yes. that has never been seen before. Right. And a couple of weeks ago, I was out in uh, Pennsylvania with John Whitmore and a bunch of his paleo students at Cedarville. And uh, we were at a trilobite locality in Pennsylvania. And I got to find a trilobite, you know, and it was a pretty decent one. And they got to keep it, which disappoints me a little, <laughs> uh, I'll just say. Um, I got my picture of it. But, you mm. know, but that's going to a student who's going to be doing her senior research project on this mm. site. And so, you know, they're cataloging and trying to find, you know, all this stuff that's on a church's property. It's really cool. And stuff has been published from this locality in the past. 
And, you know, so there's, there's good science to be had all over the place. And everybody was there. I mean, it, it sounded, <laughs> it sounded like a bricklayers convention. It was just tink, tink, tink all over the place. It was great. And, and we're there and we're joyful because this is God's world. Let's go find stuff. And so why talk about dinosaurs and feathers? One, because it's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, these fossils are so fascinating and interesting. And also because I want uh, Christians and in particular creationists to understand God's world to the best that we know it. And, and so we can avoid making arguments that are incorrect and mm -hmm. an argument that you know, were to have worked in 1987 doesn't work now, right? And it's really important because I, I run into loads of people who are like, I thought this was all solved in like the late 90s, early 2000s, <laughs> right? You know, back when they were in college and they were interested, right? And the reality is like, no, this, it wasn't solved then, um, at least not in terms of like science. I, mean, I think theologically we were, were well grounded, right? And I think scientifically we are on our way and we're still on our way in science. I think we're better now than we've ever been in the past. And I sure hope that in 30 years, we're going to be far better than we are now. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is for us as you know, and all of us are educators, right? We've all taught college classes, high school, homeschools, whatever, right? We love the conveying of information and helping people to understand what the world is like out there yeah. and if we can do that we're gonna we're gonna have to do that all the time so that people don't say oh yeah i thought that was solved 30 years ago the last time i saw you on youtube um right hopefully mm -hmm. they'll they'll keep up with creation unfolding for you know for weeks and months and years to come so that they can find out as things change what do we what do we think about it mm. yeah excellent all right well uh dr marcus ross dr matt mclean thank you guys I'm going to just take you off the screen right now as I close. Thank you, Ken. Out here. Thank you, guys. Appreciate that. So, uh, okay. So some of you who are watching, who watch me regularly, probably think to yourselves, well, you know, something's missing. Well, there it is. So, yes, I didn't have my glasses on the whole time. Well, look, uh, just to all the audience out there, thank you for participating. Thank you for the questions. Don't forget there'll be some links uh, down there in the uh, description. Uh, we did talk about homeschooling there a little bit. Uh, got a new channel. Go check that out. The link is down in the description as well. You'll find uh, 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 labs and lessons to teach to your uh, kids uh, homeschooling wise. Um, so that's it from me, Ken Colson here at Creation Unfolding. Um, don't forget, again, pound the like button, subscribe, ring the bell for easier access, and we'll talk to you again soon. So here we're going to end the show. <laughs>